welcome. Good morning. Uh, we're very happy to have you here. Before we start, I just want to mention a couple of logistical things. Bathrooms, there is a code that is needed to go into the bathrooms on this side. The code has been uh, put on the wall. Uh, it's 8362 if you want to know. But if not, there's a little sign there that says so. Um, other than that, um, well, we are here because we're going to be talking this morning about um, things and matters that have to do with nuclear proliferation or the lack of it. I don't know if we will be needing translation for this seminar, as I believe they're having some troubles with the translating booths on the other room. For that, we want to deeply apologize. Um, however, if there are any troubles, please at the end of this talk, come and talk to me or Tora, who is at the door, and we will try to help you as much as we can. I don't speak any Swedish, but I speak French and English and Spanish. <coughs> if that can be help of you, I'll try to help you. So I would like to introduce, and again, I apologize for my bad pronunciation, but I would like to introduce uh, Goran Prince, maybe I said the name wrong, <laughs> who is the, from the Swedish anti-nuclear movement. So I will just shut up now, and let's begin And this. your name? My you name is Elena. 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 Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, my name is Göran Brunse, uh, 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 in Swedish, which is not the easiest language. Uh, so I can say about 40 years ago, I studied nuclear physics here at the Lund Institute of Technology. And at that time, me and my classmates, we learned that nuclear energy was so cheap, so it was too cheap to meet, but it was virtually free of charge. Uh, secondly, we learned that the radioactive waste was dumped into the Baltic Sea and that would disappear. Uh, now I know better. Uh, but at that time, me and my classmates were, of course, quite enthusiastic about our free energy and no problems. Uh, uh, one problem with nuclear energy uh, is creating lots of radioactivity, which is basically a very dangerous substance, uh, and uh, that will last sometimes forever and anyway uh, quite long time. So we you know, uh, create a dangerous material which uh, we uh, give to our future generations. They have to handle the problem sometimes more or less forever. Uh, and that's basically unethical. Uh, one example of creating radioactivity uh, is the European Spallation Source, ESS, uh, and that is a very expensive example too. Uh, and uh, you will hear more about that during this morning session. You will hear more about the nuclear uh, energy problems in Sweden and in uh, Scandinavia and worldwide also. So uh, I will uh, again wish a very welcome to this session. Uh, the energy and climate date debate is very uh, crucial today. Uh, so I think this seminar will really deal about one of our biggest problems in the world at the moment. And, and basically nuclear energy is not a solution. It's part of the problem when it comes to the climate change. Uh, today's moderator is Eric Hegel, who is a member of the board of the Swedish anti-nuclear movement, and I'm the chairman of that movement. So I will uh, leave the word to Eric. Thank you very much. 
Yes, my name is Per Higelund and I'm on the board of the Swedish anti-nuclear movement and also working with Milkers, active in Milkers. Which means? The Swedish environmental movement's nuclear waste secretariat. Very nice <laughs> title. Well, that's a banner. It's been traveling all over around the Baltic Sea to many places. <coughs> so it's beginning to be a little worn out. I had it in uh, Kaliningrad just a month or two ago. I was down there with a project, a big middle-aged ship that was sailing around the south coast of the Baltic Sea. Started in Germany, ended up in uh, St. Petersburg. And I joined them in Kaliningrad where I had a lot of this e exhibition material. And I went on the Russian TV and asked why Russia doesn't protest against Sweden's plan for the final repository by the Baltic Sea. As Jörn mentioned, and as this uh, documentation here shows, the Baltic Sea is the most radioactive sea in the whole world. There's no other body of water that's more radioactive than the Baltic Sea. So we have a problem. And as the documentation shows too, according to the best international experts, it's Sweden that pollutes the most. A hundred thousand times more than the Russian reactors. And people in Sweden don't know about this. This is the best uh, facts that we have from international experts, from uh, SSE, <coughs> or on this uh, scientific working group under the Helsinki Commission, and the uh, German radiation protection authorities are there, and experts from all the whole region, from, from all the countries. It's their conclusion that the Baltic Sea is the most radioactive in the world, and that the Swedish reactors are the ones that pollute the most, routinely, every day, every night. Well, my little presentation here would be in kind of two sections. The first one will be about European spallation source, and in the second half, I'll just mention a little bit about Baltic Sea and the radioactive problem we have. Is that how you do it? You're going to hear a lot of sober facts about the European spallation source. I'm going to bring up a contra controversial side of this project. And you can see it on the board here. Transmutation. If you don't know what it is, it's basically a theory that you can make the nu spent nuclear fuel less dangerous, so that you don't have to store it for hundreds of thousands of years, but maybe only for thousands of years. But it's a theory. It has not been put into practice anywhere in the world. They've tested it in laboratories, like small experiments, but a real facility for transmuting waste, that's still just a theory. Nobody has built such a, such a thing, such a machine, such a facility. Today, our local politicians here in Sweden deny that the European spallation source will be used for transmutation. Mm -hmm. So why do we even mention it? Well, we don't trust the local politicians' promises because these are the international 
executive directors of ESS, who published this statement in a magazine called Physics World. And they are saying it right there, that ESS could also be used for physics and engineering research into transmutation. So if the directors that tried to promote this project tells this in a scientific magazine, I kind of tend to trust these international directors more than local politicians here that say, you know, oh, we're not going to do transportation. It's a European project. It's most likely that it ends up in Sweden, unless our uh, concerns and criticism could somehow manage to stop the project from uh, located somewhere else. Here's another Swedish politician, right-wing liberal politician, Mr. Lionborg, Minister for Research. He is talking, and it's just a couple of months ago, in very positive terms about transmutation. Uh, he kind of admits that he is not a scientist, so he doesn't know so much about it. But he thinks it's very interesting, very attractive solutions to transmute the waste. And you can also see that as Minister of Research, his message is very clear. Research into nuclear technology is going to be a prioritized area of research for many years to come. That's his opinion. It's kind of strange because in Sweden we had a referendum. We had a referendum where the outcome was that all nuclear power should be phased out Originally, they said by 2010, but they've changed that afterwards. But nevertheless, the result of the referendum was that the nuclear power should be phased out. So why the Minister for Research uh, is so favorable to transmutation and to research into nuclear technology is kind of a mystery. He does not respect the outcome and the decisions that have been made by previous governments. Here's another government member, Maud Olofsson, from the Centre Party. She explains that they uh, allocated 39 million Swedish crowners for research, which is also aimed into nuclear technology. <coughs> and a large amount of that money we have now paid to promote the accelerator in Lund. And that's just to promote it. They haven't started building it or spending any money in any other kind of way. It's just for promotion of the project and to try to secure that the project is established in Sweden and not in Spain or Hungary, which are also candidate countries. So there are several leading politicians in Sweden that are interested in nuclear research and interested in transportation. The Swedish government, they appointed the former finance minister, who has also been an EU commissioner, Alan Larsen. He was handpicked to promote the European spallation source and to see if it would be possible to get it to come to Sweden, <coughs> that we should have the project here. In his report to the government about ESS, he mentions a list of number of areas in the society which will be greatly influenced by ESS. And at the top of the list, he mentions nuclear research. Then he mentions medicine and a lot of other areas, but at the top of the list, he has nuclear research. So that's one more of the leading politicians that are kind of hinting, admitting that transmutation can really be a, an issue for ESS. Here's another press release from the ESS people that shows the size and the power of this spallation source. It says it will be a hundred times brighter than present day neutron sources. Excuse me, you said before proton accelerator, was that yes, wrong? Yes, yes, it's, a, it's nice all true, it's neutron. all true. It's a protons get uh, speeded up in this uh, accelerator. The protons are shot at a 
heavy metal target, which we'll get to also. It, it's a plan to be mercury. Now, Sweden has worked all over the world to have phased out any use of mercury because it's a very poisonous heavy metal, and even in very small, less than a gram, uh, micrograms, can be poisonous and dangerous for people. Now they're not talking about micrograms, they're talking about 30 to 40 tons of mercury. That's what this uh, ESS is planned. Then the protons will be shot at this mercury. Uh, electrons will be released, and it's the electrons that, uh, or neutrons, it's the neutrons they use as a kind of microscope to investigate matter, material matter. They can come down to the like a very, very powerful microscope, they can see subatomic particles and so on. So it's a way to do material testing and investigation on the subatomic level. Uh, here it says it's 10 times more powerful than the spallation sources currently under construction in the USA and Japan. So this will be the most powerful spallation source in the whole world. It's also the biggest and most expensive research, European research project to have ever been started in any Scandinavian countries. So this is a real big thing. Quite a few years ago now, this man, Olaf Carlson, he's a physicist and he's chairman of Sweden's alternative energy organizations. That organization is called CEO. They have departments for all kinds of alternative energy. He was one of the first persons, actually the one that got me interested in ESS, he was one of the first persons to warn about this being used for transmutation. He says, the fact that the accelerator may be the first step towards a new prototype reactor, which was first imagined by the Nobel Prize winner Carlo Rubia, on Swedish ground. This is something that nobody wants to talk about. But if you know something about nuclear physics, you should realize that the size and effect of ESS is meant for transmutation experiments on a large scale not just as occasional experiments. He says ESS could be the first phase in developing a full-scale, scary, rubia-type reactor accompanied with the necessary reprocessing plants. There are some illustrations here about the cellar field, although it's so far away from uh, Scandinavia, and although there's so, such little influx of water <coughs> into the Baltic Sea, Sellafield still pollutes 200 times more than all the nuclear reactors at the coast of the Baltic Sea. In England, this is... This yes, Sellafield in England, sure. which is so far away, yeah. is letting out radioactive pollution into the water, and the small stream of water that gets into the Baltic Sea still carries with it 200 times more radioactivity than from all the nuclear power plants around the Baltic Sea. This is an example of why we are very uh, scared and critical of anything that has to do with transmutation and reprocessing plants. And as I told you, if the Baltic Sea is already the most radioactive sea in the world, reprocessing plants and transmutation, that is really the last thing we want. That's the absolutely worst we could have by the Baltic Sea. He also said that uh, Lund, the muni municipality, which is expected to give territory or space for the ESS project, they should get some kind of legal guarantees, not just kind of promises <coughs> that we're not going to use it for transmutation. They should have a legal guarantee that it's never going to be used for, for transmutation. I don't know if it's possible to get this type of guarantees. But that's his recommendation. You should be very careful. If you give space to this project, make sure it's not going to be used for transportation. That's what he said. 
Here's a quote from OECD, powerful organization. It talks about accelerator-driven nuclear waste transportation. And that's what uh, Rubia came up with. This is his idea, this transportation. An accelerator, that's what ESS is, proton accelerator. An accelerator-driven <coughs> nuclear waste transportation system would consist of three major subsystems. A proton accelerator, which is ESS. A burner reactor, where spallation and transportation would occur. And a processing plant. That's the same as a reprocessing plant. That's the same as a cellophile type of facility. Excuse me, five megawatts is the minimum to run it. That's five big nuclear reactors is needed to run it. Yeah. No. <coughs> Excuse me, no, this is uh, okay. not true. Uh, five megawatts is <coughs> exactly the size of the ESS facility as they uh, plan it today. Yes. A nuclear power facility has uh, 100 yeah. times more power. Oh, so the gigawatts. Okay, yeah. sorry, I was, I was off. But that's just to show that it's not much anyway. <laughs> it's a big, uh, complicated and a facility. It's a complicated facility. It takes a proton, a proton accelerator, a burner reactor, <coughs> and a reprocessing <coughs> plant. That's what all these pieces. This is what I already told you, that reprocessing plants, they pollute hundreds of times more than a normal nuclear reactor. Is cellophane only reprocessing or is it uh, uh, making the fuel for the Swedish reactors also? I believe they do both. Yes, I think so. So, so all reactors in Europe are, are to blame even if they don't send back their, their they are to blame also for what comes from Sellafield. We can't say the Swedish reactors are pure. So the Baltic Sea has a negative world record and Swedish reactors routinely release 100,000 times more radioactive pollution into the sea than the Russian reactors near St. Petersburg. So we're worse, much, much worse than the Russians. Since the theory of transmuting nuclear waste automatically means more reprocessing plants, this would only multiply our problems of radioactive contam contamination. Radioactivity can kill people or make them or our children seriously sick. Uh, Chris Busby, our friend and expert from England, he can tell you much more about this, why it's dangerous and that it actually kills people can make them seriously sick. It could be a whole long list of different cancer sicknesses. It can be mutations. It can be uh, deformed babies or even dead babies. This is what radioactivity can do and does do. So we don't want ESS here at these waters that are already so radioactive polluted. We don't want them to use mercury, which Sweden has been working to phase out on a global level. The mercury is, besides being poisonous, very poisonous, also becomes radioactive. And afterwards, these 30, 40 tons of mercury has to be stored as radioactive waste for 3,000 years. Uh, it's a very delicate, sensitive uh, project in the design for the ESS. It says that it should not, they, they want guarantees that they would not have ele electricity failure for more than 0 0.6 seconds <laughs> per year. What happens otherwise? It risks uh, overheating, it risks uh, blowing uh, radioactive mercury in a big cloud all over the region. It could uh, contaminate the whole region of the vessel. Another thing, besides from this, uh, very, very tough and unrealistic demand to the steady electricity supply. I mean, we have blackouts that last for days or hours. It's not very long time ago, uh, Oscar Sam 
caused a blackout both in all of southern Sweden and in Denmark. So how can we have a demand that says only 0 0.6 seconds per year of power failure? And the final aspect I think is very worrying is, for instance, if there are some crazy terrorists that want to punish Denmark or want to punish Sweden, it could be because of the Muhammad caricatures in Denmark or the caricature that this uh, Swedish uh, writer made with uh, Muhammad as a rondel dog, dog. Well, if anybody want, is really <coughs> mad at Denmark or Sweden and wants to punish us, they will have a great help from this ESS project. It's not difficult to sabotage it. It's not difficult to cut the electricity. Uh, so we have an uh, electricity failure. And it could spread a cloud of radioactive mercury all over the region. If they want to get at Denmark, they can just wait till the wind is coming from the east, and then they can do it. Then it'll hit all of Denmark, move the whole capital, destroy the whole capital of Denmark. So that's another aspect of it too. It's a very risky, high-risk project. This type of high-risk project should not be placed in the middle of the most populated area in all of Scandinavia. That's where most people live, you see, in the Ersons region. So if you have such a dangerous project, you should not put it right there in the, in the most populated area. Of you shouldn't put it anywhere. <laughs> well, preferably not, but I mean, if they should have it somewhere, they should be way out in the boondocks. Is it? Yes. Well, that was the first section of my presentation about ESS. The next will go really quickly. Have you found a word so we can best describe to common people what it's called? Because spallation is nonsense to everything. Yeah. I, I, yeah. There has been a little confusion in the program since uh, we should have a starting uh, point that the ESS Scandinavia presenting the project. So after Per, I will try to make a short introduction to what it's all about. Mm -hmm. uh, I also believe uh, Nielsen Michael from Denmark is going to make a very, very uh, broad description of the project. I'm just taking out some controversial issues because I want you to have it in the back of your mind, what I've just been telling you. But you'll get much more explanations about ESS. Well, about the Baltic Sea, which reactors pollute the most? I guess to point out that this, these are powers of 10. Here you have the Russian reactors at St. Petersburg. Then you count like this, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. <laughs> the Swedish two reactors pollute 100,000 times more than the Russian ones. It's accelerating being much higher. Yeah. But around the Baltic Sea, we're the bad guys. We're the worst, and the Finns are the second ones. The Finns, they are there, Louisa and Olkiloto. If you count, that will be a thousand times more than the Russian ones. But the Swedes is a hundred thousand times more. The yellow one cannot be read from here. What is the yellow one? Olkiloto. Finland. It's not me that misspelled it. It's uh, no, 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 it's Helsinki Commission. Yes. Um, Could you explain uh, why it, uh, is it um, such a uh, great difference between Sweden and Russia? I asked the chief scientist from Helsinki Commission's scientific working group at a Baltic Sea NGO forum in 2006. I said, can you give me any explanation or any excuse why Swedish reactors pollute that much more? He just looked down and shook his head and said no. <coughs> and he's the chief scientist. He couldn't explain it, I can't explain it. I would say it's just a nonchalance. Uh, they, they are ignoring the problem. They say their, their favorite excuse is like this. Well, it's, we're letting out so little radioactivity compared to Chernobyl. <laughs> but Chernobyl was an accident. This is something they're doing routinely every day, letting out radioactivity right out into the ocean. Uh, Swedish reactors should not be compared to the worst nuclear accident ever in the history. That you can't 
justify polluting the Baltic Sea with radioactivity just by comparing it to the worst accident. The Swedish reactors, that's not an accident. That's routine operations. And it should not be uh, the other major fa factor besides Chernobyl is when they were carrying out atmospheric nuclear bomb tests. Now this, everybody has stopped. They've realized that this spreads radioactivity all over the world immediately. I mean, it gets carried around with the jet streams and the radioactivity ends up all over the planet. So everybody has agreed to stop these atmospheric nuclear power bomb, uh, nuclear bomb tests. They don't do that anymore. So you can't compare Swedish reactors routine releases to nuclear bombs either. It's a very bad comparison. If Swedish reactors should be compared to something, they should be compared to the other nuclear reactors around the Baltic Sea. And that shows that the Swedes are the bad guys, if they should show <laughs> this. OK, I'm just about finished. The Swedish solution, I'm being a little satirical here. Both Sweden and Finland have come up with a plan to store the most dangerous radioactive waste that spent nuclear fuel, <coughs> which nobody in the world knows how to take care of. They have come up with a solution. They are going to store it at the coasts of the Baltic Sea. Even under. Yes. However, this is not a private matter for the two countries, Sweden and Finland, to decide. International law gives every neighboring country the right to object to these plans because it's transboundary effects. It affects the neighboring countries. So my encouragement to you is we, we should all make our voice heard. We should ask our governments to protest against these plans. The Danish government should protest against these plans. I've said the same to the environment ministry down in Latvia. I was visiting Riga. I said, Miss, my strongest encouragement to you is that you should object to these plans of the final repositories for spent fuel by the Baltic Sea. Now they can put it somewhere else in a safe mountain inside the country. I guess you are going to talk <laughs> a little bit about this. There are other solutions than, than to put it by the most radioactive sea in the whole world. That's not a good place to put it. Even a child can figure that out. We can't make it any worse. So make your voice heard and protest. I probably don't have time to get well. I should mention this about climate change. Nuclear power stations emit gigantic amounts of hot water from their cooling systems. They take in gigantic amounts of water and they let it out in the ocean again, and then it's hot water. This negatively affects climate change in our ocean. It also can knock out the fish breeding grounds when the wind direction changes, suddenly comes hot water to where the fish are making babies, and this hot water will knock out the, breed, the eggs and so on. So it kills fish in that way. It also speeds up the growth of the <coughs> blue-green algae that we have every summer and that keeps people from bathing in the sea and uh, makes people sick and makes your dog sick. If it goes down to the water and drinks some water, it can get really sick. This is also, uh, nuclear power stations are also uh, part of the reason for this. If you look over there, where it says don't nuke the climate, there are satellite pictures taken from space of the hot water coming out from the nuclear power plants. And you can see, for instance, ring has on the west coast of Sweden, if you look at it later, the hot water from ring has almost dominates the whole ocean between Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, Canada, and so on. Yeah. There's also satellite pictures of the hot water releases from Sosnovibor, the Russian reactors. Well, there is uh, one more article from the Times newspaper. It shows that the, the filters at the cooling water intake kills billions of fish. At just one nuclear power station there, they say it's a 250 million fish in five hours that get killed in the filters. Now everybody blames the fishermen because they're catching too many fish. That's why the fish are dying out and we don't have, we're losing fish species. Everybody blames the fishermen, 
but nobody blames the nuclear power station. How much do you say? 500, what do you say? 250 million in five hours at one what? power station. 250 million That's what it says in this Times uh, article, and uh, they quote uh, World Wildlife Fund and some scientists. You can look at that article. Uh, yes, I have to stop. Oh, okay. Our friend Bo. Also, one of the uh, starters of the local resistance uh, group against the European Spanish source, local uh, people in London that don't want the project to come to me. Bo Venerey. Jag står här egentligen för att göra en kort föredragning över istället för då ESA Skandinavia. Det blir ingen lätt uppgift. Jag har engagerat mig mycket i det. Jag är här på behalf av... Anyway, I think most uh, people understood what I was saying. Uh, normally, uh, the ESS Scandinavia should ha have had a speech and uh, explain the status of this project at the moment. Uh, but they, they were not willing to come, and so I will try to uh, make a very short uh, briefing about uh, the project. And, uh, uh, normally, I'm engaged... Uh, Normally, I am engaged uh, in a working group against ESS, and my background is uh, that I have uh, I was uh, educated in chemical technology on the Chalmers University of Technology, and uh, there I took my PhD. And lately, I've been uh, working here in Lund as a chemist. <laughs> This summer, uh, as late as uh, as late as uh, the 17th of June, I think it was, uh, there was a um, an update of uh, the questionnaire. This is uh, the papers that have been left down to the European <coughs> Commissions. Uh, there are uh, expert commission deciding. Uh, which is a country that should be gratified to have this large uh, research facility. And um, <clears throat> you can see that uh, the Swedish alternative, uh, they have uh, put a lot of efforts to make this look like a really uh, good and ecological project. You can see with the flowers and bees and <laughs> they have green roofs of some buildings. They have wind power. <laughs> and here is uh, the uh, target station, which contains, as you already heard, large amounts of, uh, of mercury. And the site is here. It's just uh, northeast of Lund, quite close to the the um, housing. This picture you cannot read, it's uh, from the second page of, of this uh, um, application or whatever you should call it, a questionnaire where they tell how they should solve different problems and what <coughs> Sweden can, uh, which efforts Sweden can make to make this a good uh, for for the installation source. You can read that uh, we have uh, an idea localization in Lund. And for instance, that uh, 
Sweden has set up a goal of making ESS, and Max Lamblet is another research facility, uh, CO2 neutral. Very good. This picture shows uh, what uh, uh, the ESS Scandinavia believes could be achieved with the research uh, in the field of energy, environment, new materials, everyday chemistry, health, new medicines, better trains, airplanes, wings, etc. Santa Claus list. <laughs> yeah, something like that. And here is a picture I talk about uh, showing what's happening inside the accelerator. Normally, uh, or originally I should say, originally this spallation source was designed for two target stations and the target is the target for a proton accelerator. Uh, protons, that is uh, nuclei from, from hydrogen, they are ionized and then accelerated in a lo long, long, long magnetic uh, tunnel and uh, reaches close to the speed of light and then is uh, made to crash into the target which is filled with mercury. Here we have a mercury nuclei, uh, nucleus, when the proton comes and hits the mercury uh, nucleus, it will uh, affect, it, it, um, the mercury has got a lot of extra neutrons uh, and they will uh, leave from this collision, they will leave and spread out like n neutron radiation and through these guides, you can then use them for kind of microsco microscopic uh, investigations. And this type of microscope can uh, look at, uh, for instance, large molecules that would uh, otherwise be destroyed by the high energy from, from uh, other types of um, microscopes. Interesting to see that also when this nucleus is hit, it becomes unstable and some of them will fall into pieces and creating new type of elements. <clears throat> um, around in Europe there are different laws uh, considering nuclear facilities. In Sweden, this one would be considered not as a nuclear facility, but like a research facility, which makes it much easier for them to get permission to build it here. Uh, if you can read this, is it possible to read this? Uh, no, it's not possible. It says the ESS facility will not be defined as a nuclear installation under Swedish law. Furthermore, uh, it's possible for the Swedish government to decide if this facility should be um, investigated under, uh, under the um, environmental laws. In fact, the Swedish government could decide to give a permit um, for the ESS facility um, and uh, say go above the law, give the, this permission uh, above the law. So there's no veto for Lund? No, and in fact it's worse than that. Normally uh, the process would be that they uh, uh, the, the planning would be presented to the Lund community, but in this case, uh, the community decided to 
to not do that, but only to make a detailed plan for the area. This means that according to the rules, uh, only the people living in the area can oppose to it. So this is something as extraordinary. And I don't know if it's legal, but it's on the limit. But that is. <clears throat> in the end of this paper, or somewhere towards the end, you can read that the ESS facility will contain a liquid metal target, mercury, lead, or lead this, this <coughs> to generate neutrons. And they expect that uh, the, the laws are made uh, both in Sweden, according to the laws both in Sweden and in Europe, it's possible to uh, to, uh, for, for the government to uh, make this um, to legalize it. I mean, it, it's to to, uh, to decide to build it here. Can I just ask one question? Uh, if if uh, the people living in the area would um, say that they, they are not, a majority are not interested to have this facility, do they have to listen to it? Excuse me, I did not get if, if the citizens <coughs> living in the area close to this facility, yeah. uh, if they oppose the proposal to, to build it in the area where they are living, yes. do this group actually have to listen to them, I mean, take a decision? I, I think they wouldn't listen. They'll just I'm tell sure that it's safe. They are allowed to have an opinion, that, but then it's yeah. not... Uh, like, the, the, yeah, they don't I, have a veto. I, I, I will, I will, um, I will come as the <coughs> last speaker too, and uh, I think we're re already a little bit higher after in the program. But I, I just, well, just very short, I want to say that uh, yeah, I think I believe that they have said all the time. In Scandinavia, said all the time, it will, there will be uh, trials. Uh, you have, will have all possibilities to oppose this. It will be. Uh, investigating very closely uh, according to the environmental laws and so on, but they have this uh, uh, possibility to to go <coughs> above the law. And uh, last, I want you to note that uh, they want to build a five megawatt station, whatever it means. It means that it is about the double size of what they're building in, in the United States, or they are all started to run in the United States. But they want to have the possibility to upgrade it to a larger one. And they also want to have the possibility to have a second target station containing as much mercury, of course, as the first one. That was the end of my presentation. It was not very positive from ESS Scandinavia, but I, I hope that you got an idea anyway about what, what it's all about, what, what they expect it to do, and a little bit about how it works. Also. Is mercury the only possible heavy metal? Or could they use lead or gold or I don't know what? Uh, they say it's possible to use other types of compounds like this much lead but uh, they did not prepare for it and it's a novelty that is possible it's probably not possible to achieve at least not in the short time they plan for and uh, apart from that lead and bismuth they are not very nice uh, compounds either and um, I, they also say that this uh, is a closed circuit, so the, target, the, the mercury will be kept inside there. But look at this picture. How, here is how they take off one part from this container of mercury and uh, let out the mercury and remove this very radioactive piece. And then they're putting it back again. <coughs> I, I also uh, lost in my, uh, after, uh, I mean, as a last speaker, I will show some more pictures from inside uh, the ESS and uh, how it works and what will happen inside. 
I believe I should introduce our friend from Denmark, <coughs> he is in my program. He has been uh, doing a great amount of research about the ESS and have been following it for years and he's probably the one that knows most details about the European Spanish Resource and most of our people. So Nils Henrik, we're very happy you could come to Sweden today. Thank you, uh, My name is uh, Nils Henrik uh, I have a legal degree from Copenhagen University. Uh, the reason I'm here today, I guess, is because I and organized the first critical seminar on ESS back in uh, 2002 in, in Copenhagen in collaboration with uh, the Danish Ecological Council and uh, some other NGOs from Denmark and Sweden. And since then I have tried to uh, uh, follow the, the ESS project uh, rather closely. And uh, in my presentation, I will try to uh, uh, update you on some of the most recent uh, developments of the ESS uh, project. Uh, I just have to find my presentation, actually. Okay, thank you. You just have to bear with me for, hopefully, uh, very short time. Go, okay. Yeah, I have problems with the, the Swedish. Okay, there my presentation is thank you. <coughs> So, trends and risk of the European spoliation uh, source in, in Lund. Uh, just uh, to begin, uh, uh, a short comment on the title of the, the seminar, uh, not to uh, appear too obstinate, but uh, uh, if you look at the title, uh, European Spoliation Source in Lund uh, for Future European Nuclear Waste Cemetery. Uh, I, I have to respectfully uh, conclude that it's a little over the top. Uh, I mean, ESS is a research facility, uh, but it cannot in its present uh, form be turned into an, an industrial facility. And such uh, plans have uh, never existed in the many uh, reports on ESS uh, that have emerged uh, over the last uh, 15 years or so. So you could, uh, if you want to, make a point, uh, say that the, the, the title is, is a misunderstanding and perhaps also a bit uh, misleading. Uh, however, there is still a legit legitimate concern uh, regarding uh, transportation. Uh, I basically agree with most, if, if not everything, that Pierre uh, said in his presentation. Uh, uh, when we made the first critical seminar five years ago, in Copenhagen on uh, ESS, uh, the, the main theme was transportation, and we uh, commissioned a memorandum from an ind independent uh, energy agency, Wise Paris, uh, uh, that concluded that there is indeed a double strategy in the ESS project management uh, process concerning transportation research. Uh, it can be uh, applied, and it was. Uh, a strategic and logical orientation throughout uh, the project development. Uh, and uh, Wise Paris concluded that uh, the reasons uh, preventing the ESS Council uh, from maintaining the transportation option in ESS uh, were not technical, but political and uh, financial. Uh, this uh, this uh, memorandum from Wise uh, uh, Paris uh, 
five years ago uh, triggered a boycott of our seminar. I mean, uh, also then had the ESS Scandinavia uh, said that they would attend, uh, and they 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 boycotted uh, and has 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 done that uh, practically uh, in every seminar uh, since then organized by Green uh, NGOs on on ESS. Uh, but they also said that uh, uh, ESS would definitely not be used for uh, transportation uh, uh, experiments. Uh, however, uh, it is still not contested that the strategic core of transportation technology uh, is still present in the in the design for for ESS, and it will allow future development developments to reintegrate re uh, transportation. Uh, you also have to take note of the fact that uh, seven out of the 26 new neutron scattering uh, facilities around the world uh, that you have today uh, have designs comparable uh, with the ESS uh, and uh, most of them are, are used for, for <coughs> or this seven out of six are used for transportation uh, uh, experiments including uh, the uh, J Park in in uh, in uh, Japan, uh, I think one of the the, the top four neutron uh, uh, neutron scattering facilities in the world uh, today, and uh, the most recent uh, J Park in Japan is definitely used for transportation uh, experiments. Uh, so uh, the transportation uh, scene aside, what is at least in my opinion uh, the most urgent issues with respect to SS in law. Uh, in my opinion, there are mainly concerns about safety uh, relating to the facilities uh, content of radioactive uh, heavy metal. Uh, the, the second theme is the, the unco uncontrollable spiraling of costs to an even more unacceptable living. And here taking uh, also into account the, the project science case and potential as a regional development factor. And uh, third and last, please, the facilities in almost electricity consumption. I will briefly uh, try to lead you through uh, uh, these issues, uh, and uh, I will try to do it uh, quite rapidly. So if you have any questions, and if it's uh, okay with the moderator, uh, please feel free to uh, break in and, and ask uh, questions. Can you just give an idea how many Milliards of euros. This is is it two three milliards and Sweden perhaps. I will come to, to that, that shortly. Time. But uh, again, if you have questions, uh, feel free, uh, like you, you did, uh, to bring in and and, and ask them. So, uh, with respect to the concerns about safety, uh, seven years uh, after uh, Lunds uh, uh, and ESS Scandinavia's uh, bid to host uh, ESS, uh, there are still no uh, risk assessments of the facility or any uh, worst case scenarios, uh, and uh, as Bo uh, Ampere has, has pointed out, the uh, target station consists of heavy metal uh, that has to be stored in a nuclear waste repository for 3,000 years after the decommissioning of the, of the facility. So uh, an explosion, uh, that would be a problem, because it could spread uh, heavy metal not only over the city of Lund, but the whole region, including the Danish metropolitan area. If you look at a map of the Ørsund re region, uh, you will see, as uh, Pierre rightly mentioned, it's actually uh, the most uh, densely populated uh, region in uh, the whole of uh, Scandinavia. Uh, larger cities in the city uh, Lund, 100,000 inhabitants, uh, five, uh, ESS facility 5 kilometers from city center, Malmö, uh, 262 inhabitants, 25 kilometers away, Copenhagen and the Danish metropolitan uh, region, 40 kilo kilometers away from, from uh, uh, the center, almost 2 million inhabitants, and uh, uh, finally uh, Helsingborg, uh, 50 kilometers away, uh, almost 120,000 inhabitants. What is, the prob what is the predominant radioactive isotope that's going to be produced? Uh, I have, have to say, I, I don't know, I mean, it's not like the, the inventory in a nuclear uh, power station where you have the cesium-137. I think who will actually touch upon that subject later. Excuse me. I, I, have, I have a small picture <coughs> of the in, inventory of the 
contents. We'll see this later. Yeah. But I, I will, uh, I will tr uh, try to describe some of the, the problems uh, with uh, the target stations at the continent of, of heavy, heavy metal. So, uh, what could happen uh, in, uh, in this uh, uh, facility? Well, according to the report uh, from the people who actually developed the project uh, in the Forschungs Centrum Munich in, in Germany, accidents may be initiated by events within the fa facility itself, uh, like rules of the cooling, problem being mismatched, leaks with target hole or moderator enclosure, internal uh, fires uh, may be connected to ex external events like earthquake, airplane crash, digital external fire or gas cloud ex explosion. And uh, these accidents could, according to the developers of the project, be very serious. Uh, uh, Excuse me. Will you have this on your home page so we can get it afterwards if we get your address? So, because these details are very important. Uh, I, will, exactly. I can give it to you here, and, and I don't know if there plans to uh, make the presentation public on, on the Ford Companion website or the Big House Yes. Uh, with respect to serious uh, accidents in the nuclear installation, there are no dose limits uh, in most e EU countries. Uh, and you have to uh, produce an emergency plan uh, which defines uh, details of emergency measures for protection of the public, uh, uh, sheltering, evacuation, relocation, etc. Uh, so what kind of and how much radioactive heavy metal does ESS contain? Uh, Ugo has mentioned it uh, briefly and I think he will turn to this subject. But, uh, according to ESS Scandinavia, it will be either lead bismol or lead the bismol. Uh, it probably means mercury. Uh, if you look at the, the, the most recently completed uh, nu neutron scattering facilities, J. Park in, in Japan and S, uh, NS as of, uh, uh, in, in the, the US, uh, here you have uh, uh, a content of, of uh, mercury in, in the target stations uh, that is uh, 20 tons, and these facilities are considerably smaller than. Uh, ESS in London. However, if you look at the, if you, I mean, I had have, have this problem uh, many times, and I think everybody who takes an interest in uh, ESS in London, uh, if you actually uh, want to to uh, find out precisely how big is the target, uh, then you have a problem because there's a deliberate strategy on the part of not only ESS Scandinavia but also its two competitors. Uh, depression in Hungary and, and Bilbao, in in uh, in in in, uh, in, 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 in Spain, uh, not to re reveal the question of, of heavy metal. I mean, uh, uh, there are dozens of re reports, uh, but the very few facts on this uh, very concrete uh, issue. Uh, however, uh, there are uh, several estimates, uh, but obviously not from uh, ESS. Uh, uh, Scandinavia and the other consortia themselves. Uh, so uh, the, the report from uh, Forsund uh, Fors, 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 <coughs> says uh, 30 tons. Uh, and how often do they add 30 tons again? After two or three years? There is, it's not a very much replacement. I, I, I think that the <coughs> probably knows more about this, but I, 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 I think they, they expect that the, 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 the heavy metal uh, in the target station, whether they are one or two, is another uh, issue, but they expect the heavy metal basically to last to the end, uh, and that would uh, be a 40 years uh, lifetime. But I'm not 100% sure, but uh, I get the impression that they don't expect uh, much uh, replacement of, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the heavy metal in, in the target station. So there are two, uh, also two uh, safety reports from Stutzvik. And uh, an ESS partner uh, that, that would say uh, that is a, a, a partner in the uh, ESS uh, con consortium. Uh, uh, one report says uh, 30 tons, another 40. Uh, then you have a, a assessment from uh, uh, Lund, uh, Lunds Tekniska Högskola, uh, which says 30 to 40 uh, tons. And, and then you have, and finally, there's an estimate from uh, Linda Birgit, that was here today, and, and Lund's Naturschutz training, uh, and she, she uh, mentions that it could be uh, up to 60 tons in case of uh, two uh, target stations. And uh, you have to bear in mind that uh, uh, everything above uh, the 
about 50 tons uh, is, is actually uh, 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 to trigger the implementation of the, the European Cerviso uh, Directive. So you are in a data category that actually uh, uh, equals uh, the, the, the uh, Cerviso facility in, in Italy. I mean, that is, well, uh, that is quite interesting. Uh, so what is the, the worst case scenario? Uh, that would be explosion or fire in a target uh, station that weakens the containment where, uh, and at the same time uh, the, uh, the mercury is, is heated. Uh, and this uh, uh, could cause a dispersal of radioactive and toxic uh, mercury uh, and other material over a vast area. Uh, so you have two factors here, the radioactive uh, substances which are dangerous in themselves and uh, you have uh, mercury, uh, which is also very uh, to toxic. Uh, uh, as Bo has mentioned, uh, ESS is technically and reality a nuclear uh, facility, uh, although not a, a nuclear power station, because I mean they use uh, the energy for for research and, and not for for uh, for uh, heating or, or, or making uh, generating uh, electricity. Uh, but the, the content uh, and the content of radioactive heavy metal, uh, if it is set at, at 30 tons, is a little under half of the content of radioactive heavy metal in the Barsenbeck 2 reactor, uh, which was uh, 76 uh, tons. Uh, but you have to bear in mind that the potential release of radioactive substances does not comprise the same elements. Basically, it's not the, it's not as dangerous, but it gives you an idea about the, about the, about the, the danger level in general. Uh, again, there are no impact scenarios, uh, uh, and uh, it seems that the SS Scandinavia has has no intentions of, of producing uh, any. In fact, in the latest report, uh, they state that uh, even the, the choice of heavy metal uh, does not have to be made before uh, 2012. Uh, I respectfully disagree with the, this uh, estimate because they will have to uh, make public uh, such information on the European uh, Environmental Impact Assessment Procedure. Uh, procedure. Uh, and and uh, again, if, if Swedish law says that uh, they can get away with it. I, I think that, uh, <coughs> that uh, uh, they will have to do it anyway. So the type of metal, uh, heavy metal will have to be revealed as well as worst case impact scenarios in case of a serious accident <coughs> at, the, at the facility. Uh, so again, a few words about the European uh, IEI directive. Uh, because you, uh, because you have this European procedure, which, which I guess I'm not an expert in Swedish law, uh, has been implemented uh, in the Swedish legal system. It will be possible for citizens in the Eurozone region and Greek uh, NGOs to take legal action if uh, impact scenarios are not included in the material for the upcoming AEF uh, procedure, and that would. Uh, include Danish citizens and NGOs because uh, pursuant uh, to the es ESPO convention uh, this proce procedure would have to involve the Danish authorities and the Danish public. What does ESPO stand for? Uh, it's uh, actually named after the, the Finnish uh, uh, city ESPO but uh, some, so for some reason they call it ESPO in, in English. I mean, you, uh, it's an environment. We are probably know what it is. Uh, yes, it's uh, an international treaty uh, that grants the public uh, access at, uh, and, uh, to, to information on the environment and participation in, in, uh, in decision, public decision making. It's a United Nations uh, convention. Uh, that might be the case, yes. But it, as a, EU and, and uh, all the European countries have, have, has, have actually uh, uh, ratified the, the treaty. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to bore uh, you with a long uh, legal uh, uh, presentation, but uh, just a, a few uh, keywords. Uh, I mean, uh, environmental considerations must be impl implemented at the early stage in decision making. Uh, 
uh, there has to be transparency uh, and uh, there has to be uh, uh, integration with respect to all the environmental uh, media and of course public participation participation in uh, in uh, in decision making the five steps uh, i don't have to uh, go into that uh, okay that that was basically uh, what i had about the, the safety concerns uh, so if you have any uh, questions about this section of the presentation uh, i would take them, uh, afterwards. take them afterwards okay so another of the problems uh, with ESS, because it's uh, a typical mega uh, a pro project, is uh, obviously the spiraling of costs. I mean, the, the cost levels uh, are uncontrollable. Uh, and that is uh, basically because of, of factors such as long plan planning horizons, a multi-actor process with often conflicting interests, uh, project scope and an ambition level that changes over time and it certainly has uh, for the last uh, seven or eight years in, in the ESS uh, project and uh, uh, also unplanned events that are unaccounted for leaving budget and other contingencies uh, inadequate. Uh, in this uh, in this sort of, of project uh, uh, there's also often misinformation about costs, benefits, and risks. Uh, and, uh, I have to finish now. Okay. Uh, well, I would like to go to my recommendations uh, at least. Uh, uh, that would take a couple of minutes. Uh, so the the cost, how, how many milliards of euros? Uh, well, uh, the Swedish government okay. agreed uh, to. to uh, Paid 30 percent of the construction costs in February 2007. A year later, uh, the official estimate of uh, of the construction costs had risen by 50 percent, according to uh, ESS Scandinavia themselves. If the decommissioning costs are in included, uh, and there are cost overruns, uh, obviously. Uh, which are also unaccounted for. And there's a, a cost control structure that's copied uh, from uh, the thermonuclear experimental reactor ITER in, in France, uh, which is now going to be uh, double as expensive as uh, projected. And they have to uh, agree on uh, a whole new, new uh, budget. So uh, I'll leave, uh, I'll leave the, the the costs, and uh, I would have liked to uh, talk about the Scandinavian platform to host ESS. I mean, the Swedish uh, government uh, uh, are willing to pay 30% of the uh, of the investment costs, uh, but they would like other Scandinavian countries, and in this case mainly Denmark, to uh, to cover an additional 15%. Uh, and and uh, a decision on, on this uh, question is expected uh, at any time. Uh, I had some comments, but uh, hopefully you can see uh, them on the on the internet. So, what are my recommendations with respect to uh, what I consider the main issues: safety concerns, uh, spiraling of of, of uh, costs, and uh, obviously the enormous uh, electricity consumption. I mean. Uh, that I would like to uh, mention very briefly. Uh, ESS is currently being uh, greenwashed as a would-be carbon neutral research facility uh, whose uh, power supply is to originate from renewable energy sources. Uh, however, with two target stations uh, implemented, the electricity uh, consumption equals the consumption of a Danish city uh, between 90,000 and 110,000 uh, <coughs> inhabitants. Uh, the current proposal has a, uh, dem has a demand for electricity capacity of 40 megawatts. That equals uh, middle Golden offshore wind farm, which until 2001 was the largest in the world. But your numbers are 30 times greater than his. Five megawatt, and this is no. That's uh, that's the description of the uh, accelerator. Here we talk about the the capacity need for for uh, uh, powering the whole facility, uh, and uh, 
SS Scandinavia sets the facilities annual electricity consumption of 310 gigawatt hours a year. And that's more than seven times the electricity consumption of Copenhagen University, uh, which has 30,000 uh, and 5,000 5, employees. Uh, okay, just my recommendations. Well, uh, I'll just finish with my, I have five uh, recommendations uh, which I would ask uh, people to consider. I mean, uh, if one is, uh, uh, will be the, the, the SS host site, and uh, there are recommendations about this uh, as early as this month by an expert group on the European strategy to, uh, for, for research infrastructure. Uh, I mean, in simple, this month you could actually know if ESS is, is coming to law. Uh, if this happens, uh, NGOs and, and private citizens in the Ørsund uh, region should prepare to take legal action if SS Scandinavian does not include worst case environmental health and economic impacts in our in case of a serious accident in the EEA uh, procedure. Uh, they should also ask uh, the Swedish government and the possible members of a Scandinavian platform to host the SS and stakeholders to clarify the moral and legal implications of the safety risks of ESS in law. And this, this would imply uh, full responsibility for uh, environmental damage and economic uh, losses. My third uh, recommendation would uh, be to uh, ask the Swedish government and uh, the members of the Scandinavian platform and stakeholders to cap the cost of ESS. Uh, overruns beyond a certain level must be unacceptable. And then you also have to reveal the real uh, costs uh, because uh, uh, Sweden is actually donating uh, the site for free and uh, we will uh, probably later explain how, how big and expensive it is as well as a, lo a, a lot of other services uh, which you can read on the internet. And finally uh, you have to have uh, the, this uh, independent investigation of, of the project. Uh, I mean, it has never emerged. Uh, uh, we have asked for it uh, for five or, or six years. Uh, uh, we thought it would come uh, uh, earlier this year uh, when the Danish government uh, promised to uh, investigate the project before uh, they eventually gave their consent to Provost, but uh, it didn't happen. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I think this, my, my time has run out. Don't tell me again. Finland, and let's come here to help us with this seminar. Yes, I've been for too long, but it's not my fault, it's the nuclear industry's fault. Um, uh, when listening to the speakers before, the recent speakers, um, it seems that Sweden is going to get the biggest ESS project in the world, and Finland is going to get the biggest nuclear power reactor in the world, and we will most probably be the first nation in the world to uh, start uh, putting uh, spent fuel into the ground. We will even beat the Swedes once, once in a time. Uh, the construction of... Uh, uh, I have been asked to talk first of all about the construction of the Finnish uh, nuclear power plant and uh, the waste storage. So I start with the Olkiluoto 3 plant being built in Finland at the moment. The construction of this reactor started uh, in 2005. It's called Olkiluoto 3 and it's built by TVO, which is a wholesaler of energy to the industry. Uh, this reactor is going to be the prototype of a prototype because we say it's a prototype. But the French building the same reactor now in France say it's a prototype. Mm. So we must be the prototype of the prototype. <laughs> it is an EPR reactor, a European pressurized reactor. It, it was bought for a turnkey pre, price of 3.2 billion euros from the French-German company Areva uh, that desperately needed this deal in order to be able to go out and promote a nuclear renaissance in the world. When the project was discussed in the Finnish parliament in 2002, it was promoted as a cheap solution to tackle climate change. We know that. It's, it's the argument they use all the time. 
The price mentioned in the debate in the Parliament was 2.3 billion euros. It was bought at 3.2 billion euros. And according to French sources, all the delays and the technical problems, etc., to which I will return, uh, will raise the price by at least 2.2 billion euros. Then we are up in 5.5. I said from the beginning it will be seven, and I think they are going to beat me, which is quite good. Although the price was a turnkey price, uh, the Finnish company uh, TDO and Areva are of course now struggling, because Areva says, okay, well, it was a turnkey price, but we are pals, we are companions, and companions should be solidar to each other, and we should, we should uh, do something with the cost. And we have made, uh, uh, I have said already for a long time, uh, when the first reactor will be ready, uh, the Oculoto 3, they have plans for more. They are going to have a big, big, big uh, fight in the court. But they have to row this project ashore first. The reactor was supposed to start producing energy in 2009. At this moment, the production is estimated to start in 2011. <laughs> I say 2012, and I'm very positive in that respect. Due to the de delay, the consumers will also get a nice bill. According to Elfin, which is owned by 24 big Finnish companies in order to promote uh, cheap energy for themselves, mm -hmm. the delay cost for the, listen, for the Nordic energy consumers will be 3 billion euros. So you, all the Swedish people here, will also pay for this nice reactor. Uh, and this is because this cheap electricity will not be in the market in time, in 2009, as they promised. Um, on top of that, the energy companies have, will have to buy emission rights for at least 500 million euros. I say it's going to be a billion, because it's going to be even later. And also this bill will be transferred to us on the prices. Oculoto 3 has been hit with a lot of safety problems from the first beginning. A report by the Finnish Radiation and Nuclear Safety Authorities called Stuk, published in July 2006, clearly shows the problems, and I will mention only a couple. There, there, it's, a, it's a report of many, many, many pages. But the report stated that the number of subcontractors is large. It's more than 2,000 from 28 different countries, only 40% from Finland. Some of these subcontractors have no previous ex experience in constructing nuclear reactors. Uh, the decision factor when they choose the subcontractors, and this is took, not me, in the final phase was generally the total price tag of the offer. If the bigger uh, the bidder met the specified criteria, which was low. The report drew attention uh, to the fact that the vendor has selected subcontractors which have no <coughs> prior experience in nuclear uh, power plant uh, construction and that they have had no sufficient guidance and supervision to ensure the smooth progress in their work. Listen to this. They are building the biggest reactor in the world. It also stated that the management and the organizations participating in the constructions do not fully comply with Stuck's, the authorities' expectations concerning good safety culture. Furthermore, they said that time and resources needed for the detailed design of the unit were clearly underestimated when the overall schedule was agreed upon. Actually, they have no final plan they are doing the plan when they are building. And you could never get the permission to build such a house in the world, okay. or in the, in the European world. Mm. Already, at an early stage, the process of designing the concrete composition, the concrete manufacturing and quality control measures involve big problems. This is not now the stuk, this is what happened uh, overall. The approved concrete composition was altered during concrete mixing. So they made a new recipe. Deviations in the concrete composition and in concrete pouring 
were not addressed openly and without delay as they should have been. There were problems with the manufacturing of the reactor containment steel liner. The function of the steel liner is to ensure the leak tightness of the containment. That is to prevent any leaks of radioactive substances into the environment in case of a reactor damage. The, exactly the same problems they now have in Flamanville, the second prototype. At the beginning of August, I mean just a month ago, a fire took place in the Olki Roto 3 construction site. The first news stressed that it was a fire of minor importance, no, no big deal. A couple of days later, it turned out to have caused substantial damage in the wall construction. The outer wall structures, as well as those of the inner wall, were defected. Major concreting operations will be needed. The repair works are now estimated to take several months, but it was just a minor fire. Who cares? Mid-August, a current affairs television program of the Finnish Broadcasting Company drew attention to serious security breaches in welding work at the Orkilwater 3 site. Two reports concerning these accusations were made by Stuck, the, the radiation authorities, and handed over to the Ministry of Employment and Economy, which is uh, um, um, responsible for this building. Both reports, as we expected, attached attention to some minor problems, but the overall message was that everything was okay. Mid-August, Associated Press reported that several employees, including some in manager, managers, have reportedly left because of irregularities during the early construction phase. They just leave because they can't stand this building going on. Um, at the end of August, the Finnish Construction Trade Union issued a strike warning for the Okiloto 3 building site. It says there are irregularities concerning Polish construction workers. The French company Bouguet, who is one of the, the subcontractors, has refused to explain how builders, taxes, and social security payments are being done. So it, you see, it's, it's a big uh, flop, the whole thing. And the last, which I read when I came on the plane, uh, the last scandals concern Jukka Laaksonen, who is the general director of the Radiation Safety Authority, Stuck. In the half-year report of Areva, which was published last week, the French company, uh, uh, the French company building that is building the, the third reactor, uh, is publishing a content of a letter which Jukka Laaksonen has sent to the general manager of Areva and Le Vagron. This list letter gives serious reason to question Stuck's position as a neutral control authority. And I quote the letter. I want to assure you that my judgment of the Olkiluoto 3 project success is based solely on the actual performance of Areva in providing adequate quality and safety. In spite of some difficulties met in the past, I have no doubt about the acceptability of the final product. I have tried to indicate in all of my discussions with the technical and public audience that I am still very pleased with the choice made by TVO when they signed the contract with Areva in 2003. I fully recognize the value of Areva's pioneering work in re-establishing the capability for nuclear construction in the Western world and in the US. And I do not believe that any other company could have done better in these circumstances. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> this is the general manager of the highest authority of safety in Finland. They are not neutral. Okay, this is the Olkiluoto catastrophe and I hope all of you will help us to make it true that it never will be taken into use. But that's a dream, maybe. The final disposal of spent fuel. In, in Finland, the, this disposal is, uh, the repository is being built at the moment in Olkiluoto, close to the, this catastrophe reactor. This, the decision was taken in parliament in 2001. Uh, we have two, 200 parliamentarians. 
159 voted yes, three voted no, and the rest were absent. Also, the whole, uh, all the, uh, except one, I think, of the Green Party members voted yes. At present, there is an environmental impact assessment going on, running for the enlargement of the repository because we get this new reactor and we have plans for three more new reactors. Um, no discuss in this uh, environmental impact assessment. There were no discussion at any level about the problem uh, which is discussed for the EPR reactor with burn-up rates of 60 gigawatt days per ton of uranium, or even more. At these rates, the uranium fuel rods should burn for around a year longer than today's best fuel up, uh, burn, burn fuel up, uh, burn up fuel. And this high burn up fuel uses more enriched uranium and leaves it in the reactor for a longer time, and it gets real hot. In the IAEA guidebook published in September 2007, it states, the higher burn-up of fuel has a significant impact on the choice of the storage option and on the design of the storage systems due to the, to the increased decay heat, inter alia, which is roughly proportional to burn-up, imposing a higher cooling load to the storage system. In the new environmental impact assessment, there is no word about this. Um, in Sweden and Finland, uh, we have the same final repository model, the KBS method, about which Niklas will be talking later. So I won't go very much into this. And there is a lot of problem, and there is a lot of this debate and discussion. There is even money for, to debate. In Finland, there is no debate and no money. <laughs> uh, but I would like to mention that uh, Sven Bengtsson, who is the highest judge of the environmental court in Sweden, uh, in Milieu Actuel in 2007 that said that the SKB will, m might be started, the, the, your, your repository might be taken into use in 2022-20 because there is a long procedure about uh, choosing the locality and the whole um, environmental process you have, the court process. Uh, we have no such problems. The timetable is very fast. We are there already at the depth of, of, of uh, 296 meters. Uh, in 2002, it stated that the loading will start. Okay, it might be po postponed by some five years, but yours might be po postponed by some ten years. So uh, this is dangerous, because if we are the first ones, and we likely will be the first ones operating, uh, taking into use a repository in the whole world, uh, we might get more waste. In the IAEA, as well as in the European Union circles, it has many times been mentioned that it would be very practical with some waste repositories uh, at the best possible places. Uh, if you consider that appro approximately one third of the nuclear power uh, plant operating in Europe, in EU, will be closed over the next two decades, you might realize that this is going to be a very hot debate. Um, uh, per Kramer, a uh, very renowned Swedish uh, uh, professor of international law at the University of Gothenburg, uh, he already in 2006 uh, attached attention to, to the problem that if Sweden opens a repository, you might be more or less forced to take the EU waste. Uh, the same has been said uh, by, uh, by another uh, Swede, Joran Sundqvist, he's a sociologist, sociologist at the University of Gothenburg. He said it in an interview uh, in June, where he said that even if today our uh, bilateral agreement with the EU uh, uh, prohibits this, there are always ways that you can change the, the minds. And even if it wouldn't be made by directives and laws, it could be made by call for common responsibility and cooperation. And you know that this always works in the European Union. Um, considering the fact that uh, Finland produces so much energy and will produce more energy with uh, uh, nuclear power, there is also now the debate of uranium mining, as you have here in, 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 
in uh, Sweden. And we already start with uh, prospecting in Kusamo, which is up uh, north and in North Karelia. Uh, I was there uh, two weeks and weekends ago and saw the boreholes. And our uh, minister, Mauri Pekkarinen, who is responsible for all this, he says it's absolutely clear. If we produce uh, nuclear energy, we have also to, to do our own mining. So we have very little hope uh, that we can stop it. And uh, all this is also very much implemented in the EU treaties and in Euratom, about which uh, Birgitta will talk. So I won't go into this, but I see the Euratom treaty as a real danger to us. What comes to uranium mining and what comes to uh, the, the, the waste. And the, the mining would maybe be problematic if we now get a prospecting showing that we have the resources, that we have resources enough. And if there then is a shortage in the EU, they could say, but you have resources. And if you don't mine them, you don't get anything from us, from our, uh, because we have this common uh, um, uh, fuel market. So this is what you might go into. This is the story, and I will ask many of you to help us in the uh, deba uh, in the in the campaign. Niklas and many others here have sent a lot of good statements to the authorities during the years, and uh, unfortunately, I have to ask you to do that again. Geologist Nils Axel Mörner. He has great respect for other geologists around the world, I know. So, where have you at? Here. Thank you. Okay, my friends. I am Niklas Mono and I represent Milkas here also I'm a scientific advisor to them. Uh, and I would say elusive final uh, <laughs> solution because many people in many subjects have believed that there is a final solution. I mean, common sense reacts immediately. And in, in this little pamphlet, uh, it's written up this story also. Don't Listen to nuclear waste calls for long term isolation under strict safety. And you know why? Because of the toxicity. Geology is the key of meaningful long term assessment of adequate, whatever that could be, safety for any type of subsurface storage of high level nuclear waste. So we must do something. Of course, we have it, even if we don't like it, and even if it's imposed on us. We have to do something. And we will try to. And people say that there is um, a solution. I will sh try to show that it certainly is not. The everlasting waste. We can never get rid of waste, as a matter of fact. But we can just place it out of sight, or what is worse, place it out of our control. Mm -hmm. And when then it's, it's the waste which is ruling us, mm -hmm. not we are ruling the waste. And that's not a good way. In way. Every, from when farmers start to th throw garbage in the forest, uh, we learned that it was bad. And then step by step, it has been. Now we are polluting the, the, the lithosphere. And that's really hard to then um, solve. If ever. As long as uncertainty remains, we must keep the control, I think. Besides, the toxicity of the waste is so high that it will last for hundreds of thousands of years. So, my friend, what can we do? And I try to say a few things about that. First of all, there is, you have it in, do you have this picture in this one? So I can take it a little fast. This is the KBS3 so-called solution. But that so-called solution was based 
uh, on things one believed in the middle of the 70s, that it was completely uh, uh, stable crust. And we didn't know it. All those things which formulated the idea of it, it's gone. They are away. They doesn't exist in geology any longer. Huh. Only in the minds of the people, geologists in the SKB. So they wanted to put it, as Per said, of course, under the water, uh, close to the Baltic, under the groundwater, under the groundwater, 500 meters down, close it back, never be able to touch it again, unless with violence, and then it's closed, and by that it's final. And they think they, by that, have solved it. But solving it, then it should be not affecting us any longer, and certainly this will come back to us in the coming period. Another way, which I'm personally saying, not as a solution, but as a possibility to do what I think the best under the bad circumstances, we have been forced to act with it. It is to put it on a hill, and then it could be inland, of course, but much better. And it's above the groundwater, and it's a controlled drain system. And it is, of course, you can put bombs on it. Nothing will happen because it's far down in the rock. <coughs> but it is accessible, controllable. Controllable for the good and for the bad. Because those are things. If anything goes wrong, you should repair it. For the bad, good thing, if any solution comes in the future, one of them is, of course, this, which we have been discussing here. <laughs> if that ever comes to... to, to uh, yeah, but that is... You know, yes, yes. But that's a very great difference, you know. For me, at any rate, as a scientist, we can believe in technology. That's OK, because people can make achievements, scientific solutions. But we can never accept that we rape nature and the natural processes. The natural processes, we simply have to learn, and we have to play, and let them control our handling. That's a very, very great difference. And that's why I cannot accept this, because we have violent thing, the natural laws. And then maybe the technology for me is better. OK, that's the two options. And uh, of course, we have something in this club that is uh, um, the canister being put in water cabins. Basins in order to be chilled. And they are saying here it may last this for 100 years and then they add or more. Okay? Or more. So that means that we are up here. This is a logarithmic time. One year, 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years. And of course, this has absolutely zero if you pet some sort of safety. It has no safety at all. An ordinary bomb, boop, and it will go. A, a stop in the electric power, and it's very serious. So that is the really the sooner we get rid of that, the better. But they, they have to go up there, and then comes what I'm discussing: the future ice age. And I will show the processes which certainly say that it's impossible to sit because those people they have made computer models, and then they are sitting in a chair in their office. Ah, it will work. Of course it does. will not work. Because this, they just want to get rid of it. <laughs> so here, no way out in the future. And we have to, no, not 5,000 years. We have to go 100,000 years or even more. The other way, this is dry rock. Then, of course, it is, it is up here. It's very good seal up, but it's controllable, accessible, and you may even move it. And used for transmutation. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Of course, that is. Can you say that, please? You haven't said that. It's coming. <laughs> coming, coming. So then we are discussing the old concept, the thing which SKB and, and POSIV are resting upon. They are resting upon and they say, oh, this is solid. But it's just that's liquid. It's nothing. It's really bad what they are living And it's so old fashioned. It was maybe good 30 years ago. No. But it's not modern geology. It's just wiped out. And I happen to know these things. I had a, we have a, had a really super international 
Geological Congress in, in Oslo, where we have these things up. And I had one excursion in Sweden before the conference and one after. And we had a lot of top people of the world uh, seeing those gravel pits, including the one which um, Dita took a photo of this summer and it's here. <clears throat> which is absolutely the largest structure ever shown in the world of liquefaction. That's not bad. And one of the best that they said, God, this must be the largest f structure ever, ever shown. And then, yes, that was. So it's, it's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. So they have f full stability. And it's like a full thing, and it goes down and poof, the other goes up. Full stability. Of course, not. there's no stability. Earthquake. They calculate that the maximum earthquake in Forsmark, for example, could be 0.1 in 100,000 years. <laughs> How do you do that? It means one magnitude seven earthquake in one million years, which is 100,000 years, 0.1. Okay? But we have had five in 10,000 years. If we have had five in just in Forsmark, then there is an additional seven up in Hudiksvall, very close. And it's an additional 14 in the Meladalen region. So in this area, it's lots of them. And out of this, how can you make 0.1? Mm -hmm. I mean, what kind of mathematics is it? What kind of mathematics? A school child could say. And instead of this, we had hundreds of magnitude seven, ten, <coughs> tens of magnitude eight, and even some or magnitude not. Only old structure is reactivated. We see new fracture, new faults, I would say something. Stable plinths, it doesn't exist. We have a wonderful example in Finland <laughs> where it's perfect, we call stable plinth, surrounded by which it was fractured right uh, across. It. We have something, they don't have enough room to put the canisters. There's a lot of canisters. So they, if they have, like this, they should be in this. Here is the fault. It moves this one. But they put the canister in, in this block. Okay? But how far from the edges? I mean, geologists say kilometers, many, many kilometers. They say 50 to 100 meters. <laughs> and if they don't get 50 to 100 meters, there's no room any longer. So this is a vital thing, and we say this. Then something which they haven't even heard about, they cannot even spell it, uh, methyl venting. I will say something about it. And then a lot of other things. And then, of course, they have, they are engineers doing it. They have, and computer people, they have steady states. Because that's the only way of calculating. So they make something and calculate it. We have dynamic system, which always changes. So it means the thing which applies here doesn't apply here, and the ta-ta-ta, ta-ta-ta, ta-ta-ta. This is dynamicity. OK. Uh, so we have to reliable, unreliable, today and during 100,000 years. SKB and Posiva claims that they have is reliable today. We, the rest of the world, say, oh, it's a lot of things which remains um, to solve, to show, to improve. It's not at all clear. Many, many things, just how, how they seal off. They have, they have tunnels. Okay? In these tunnels, how do you seal it from here? Okay? This should be blocks of, of, of bentonite. But up here, and how do you seal it? It's really very complicated when it's high pressure and water and so on. So there are many things here. They make assumptions and models assumptions and models and say, ah, 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 this will also last for, so we can guarantee it for 100,000 years. The rest of us say, no, 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 for heaven's sake, uh, you are in problem here. The stability co um, concepts have, have collapsed. The safety concept have collapsed. Respect this and doesn't work. Method, explosive, venting is a new thing, and lots and lots of other things. So we cannot accept this for sure, for sure. And as a matter of fact, it's much, <laughs> very, very simple. Because any one of you, anyone, we can go out in the street, stop children and all. Do you think that we can guarantee full safety for 100,000 years down in the bedroom? No. We don't do that. It's common sense. 
But no, common sense and ge modern geology say the same. Okay, I say a few things. We have, instead of having very little earthquakes, if you go back in time to during the time after the Ice Age, when the uplift in Stockholm was 15 centimeters, it means 0.4 millimeter per day, per day. So of course ro rock fracture. So we have a lot of, here we have 14 in this region, here we have 13 in this region, we have five up here, in right in Forsman, <coughs> seven up in this, uh, five in, uh, and then the, um, the, those up in the north. And of course, if you take time, 5,000, 10,000, 13,000, and a little older. By the way, this is very interesting because some of the models they have done, it only operates if there is nothing here. So <clears throat> this is not innocent. What is KBO? They take only the present day. This is earthquakes, and you see this is the magnitude. So today it's just above four. That's the maximum magnitude. In historical data, it's 5.4. And in Earth, in paleoseismic old data, we are seven very well above eight. So we are in the yellow box in the paleo, they are in the blue box in today's. And as a matter of fact, they only measured 25 years between 1956 and 1971. It's really a very, very bad database. <laughs> and they projected it into the future. Here they have one magnitude seven in. in uh, in 100,000 years, and then now they are down here at 0.1 about, but if we take the yellow one, which is a reality, instead of having maximum one, I said, but it's really they say now 0.1. We have hundreds of thousands of magnitude, much more than 10 of this. And with this material, the, the um, repository of KBS that cannot be even, even suggested to, to, to uh, last for, the, for, for a long time. Then comes the di diagram on, on, on which they base the, the idea of, of a respect distance. This is 1001 10, kilometer from a fault, from this one. Okay? Here, this has moved. From this. There they say, the magnitude of displacement, you can say, this is 8, 8.2, 8, 8 7.9, this very high magnitude. And one kilometer away, they say, there is nothing more than one decimeter of fracture. No displacement. Therefore, we can come 50 to one. We can be this close, because we are magnitude 7, they say, is the highest. It's only 5 centimeters, and the canister can take that. That is model, but model could be good, model could be bad. Then we go to reality. This is the blue box, and there we say reality far above, far, far above it, and far beyond one kilometer, far up to, to, to 100 kilometers, 10 kilometers. We have meters of displacement, so this this uh, idea of 50 is just the geological insight. We must talk about this. And as a matter of fact, this is really remarkable because we have no longer room enough for the SKB. There's no longer room enough. If, this, if I'm right here, and we have observation, this is observation, this is model, and observation usually are better. Okay? So then they don't have room enough. And then this should be remembered compared to the processes. This is a model which was done by Serba in uh, 92 in, in Italy. That's observation method. Magnitude 7 earthquake, and this is the fault. What? It's not just one line, but it's, it's like a butterfly <coughs> uh, flowering up, flower structure. <coughs> and then you have sympathetic, because it's working here, things happen here. So where do we have a respect distance here? <laughs> Le less than one. It is 10 kilometers. And it's absurd. So why do you, if KBS days would have put it here, and it would have come an earthquake right through the repository. And that's what we are talking about. And that is reality contract nonsense. <coughs> this is our own 
example are from 9,663 years before present earthquake in Hudiksvall. Why we can say this is because we have the barb clay, so we can give it within a year. In another case, we have it even in the autumn of our 10,430. And that is seen in autumn, is seen at two places, 70 kilometers in between them. And uh, uh, a few weeks ago, I had showed a school class. Uh, just warm clay, and we could even there we could see this. This is the third time I have the order. At any rate, now we have Hudiksvall. We have an earthquake. We below the epicenter. It's a huge scarp. It is trusted up, and your ice flows. The ice flow came this way, and still it's there. So you can be sure that this happened after ice had gone. And this is the facet of this fault. We have it there in 12 kilometers away. 12 kilometers, you have this. <laughs> and what about the diagram which said you cannot have fracturing more than one decimeter? But here, the whole rock is about, like you have put a dynamite in it. So this is it. But we think that it's a combination with something which I will talk about. Methane venting, but also the earthquake. And this fracturing is seen 40 kilometers away. So it's a big thing. And we have about 100 sites, 100 sites. And I have investigated 50 about them. So we really map them. Now we come to this mess and venting, which is an interesting thing. I can work. Methane, methane, you know that that's a gas. It can, it can occur in two shapes, in gas and as an ice, gas or methane hydrate. And Pressure and temperature. Temperature there, pressure here, water there, or depth in the bedrock. Those control if it's gas or hydrate. So here we can have it below this, we can have, but then we have the geothermal gradient. So uh, we um, can only have it below um, uh, in the lower part. But when we have permafrost, this geothermal grain in there, instead of being here, moves here. And because of this, we can have it 80 meters below. And when we have it covered by ice, it goes all the way above. So we can have it all to the surface. And methane is degassing all the time. And I can give you a little example. In these stupid people in the Holland's awesome tunnel, Okay. <laughs> what are they doing? What are they doing now? They are freezing the bedrock to minus 40 degrees. <whistles> minus 40 degrees down here. And it's quite high pressure. I don't say that. And it, they, it's a fracture zone where it, all the time is degassing methane. So if they, I have to write this down for them. But uh, I haven't done that. But I can share it with you a little. So if they are badly off, you know, the, the moment when they take off the chili and have finished the tunnel, poof, it all <laughs> I, mean, I don't say that it is, but there is a possibility, a very strong possibility. All depends upon how much ga gas is coming from the knees. But we know that in those things, we are the gassing all day. And in Ol Olkiloto, that is one of the worst places because there it's measured in the, in the drill hole. It was very full of earth and gas. And then the surrounding is pockmarks on you know, the sea, seabed because it has been blown up. So um, this is something to believe. And why do I say this? Because we have a fantastic hill, 75 meters high, with up to uh, uh, 2,000 ton big blocks, which have been thrown up in the air. Uh, uh, and it's resting, resting here on a beach. We know that the beach is 3,200 years, so it must be younger. And then we could work and see where the shore was. The shore was at 18 meters at that time. It means 2,000 years ago. It was an explosive methane venting. It set up a tsunami wave, which, which entered into bogs. We have a bog with a shell bank in the bog. Shell bank, marine shell bank shouldn't be in the bog. And one thing, and the other thing, Lake Dellen was dammed 
three meters. Lake Gellin is 37 meters. The bog is 38. So this is a really remarkable thing. And it was a subsurface explosive method of venting of methane gas, gas from the sudden phase transition from methane hydrate to methane gas, I believe. But this is a new thing. And no, but nobody it has not been investigated and not been studied. <laughs> but we have a couple of examples uh, in another place abroad where, where, where we couldn't understand it, but now it seems very clear. So there is no solution, just a gradation of lies. The best <laughs> thing to do must be to keep the freedom of action, to keep the control of the waste. Because if you don't have a solution, don't give it to somebody you cannot. SKB continues to claim that they have an ultimate solution which will guarantee full safety for 100,000 years. This, but remember that they are doing this because nuclear power is supposed to run only if they have a solution of the waste. So they have something in the back, you know, pulling them that they have to claim it. But no one should go into something which is dishonest. That's another thing. So this is nothing but a scientific nonsense, of course. And there will be a sem seminar on September 25th, which called From Politics to Solution. We have the solution. So will be another day of disinformation mm -hmm. and lies. I think. So what should we do? I think let us admit that we cannot guarantee it. We have to admit it and see what could, should we, how should we handle in the best possible way. Not a solution, just the best to keep with the freedom of action and possible of the control. We have a proposal to harmonize with modern scientific knowledge, that's the for that. Environmental concern, don't pollute it. Energy concern, if we have energy sources, we can, there is not 94, 96% of the energy is left in the so-called waste. I used to say, if who of us go into Ica by Lingonberry, Lingonberries, which is so nice, open it and take one spoon, <coughs> delicious, close and say, oh, the rest is waste. <laughs> we don't do that. But of course, this is dangerous, so it's not an analog, but we should remember it. Because in the future, we will may be in a period where energy runs out. So we have really seen, today we are just beginning to see a problem. Um, so this is, and technological in innovation. This is, comes, of course, to what we are discussing here. Uh, Many of these things are today completely doesn't look good at all, but it's 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 a, in the human's hand to solve it. But in order to, we cannot do it with the <coughs> processes. So for me, as I have five thousand canister, it, put it in the dry rock deposition. It's shielded, accessible, controllable. We have freedom, remain freedom of action, technological innovation, and innovation. And here comes a future, not today, future. If it is. And the interesting thing with this, if it ever comes there, they have 40 years lifetime. So if they should solve anything, it's not something which, have, which <coughs> becomes solved in 100 years. It's something which is in the near future. But this is just an option. I don't plead so much. And of course, if we do that, we get one tenth, which is 500 canisters. And five canisters would very easily fit in two deep, very super deep boreholes. Five, three to four kilometers, three to five kilometers step. Well, if you have all of it, you have to have 20 and you can pose a completely other problems. But this is one, and of course you get the energy. So that is a possibility. In conclusion, final solution is a big bluffer. <laughs> uh, truly, it is nothing but a dead end. Yeah. <laughs> As a, as a serious way of handling the waste and as a long-term destiny for life on Earth. Because this is what it all really concerned, the destiny of life on Earth. Because we are sitting here, but we don't end Earth in 100 years or 1,000 years or, or 10,000. We just have a continuity. We must always do everything possible 
to pre preserve environment. And to use the KBS and POSIVA method is really very, very bad. Yeah. But of course, we have to discuss it, we have to debate it. In Sweden, there is still, so to say, a way back. But in Finland, they have done this um, remarkable thing that they have given um, preliminary um, dis um, decision that they can start it. And during the process of working, they could improve it and solve the support question. Yes. Thank you. Now I'm especially proud to introduce Dr. Chris Busby. He's a scientist and an expert on low-level uh, radiation. <laughs> yes, thank you, Dr. Chris Busby. And there is an interesting parallel situation. They used to say, we used to say in the environmental movement, that the Irish Sea between England and Ireland was the most radioactive in the world. But I've told you today that the international experts now say it's the Baltic Sea. But anyway, it's a parallel situation. The problems that uh, they ha have with the solar field and the pollution of the Irish Sea is very similar to the problem we have with the Baltic Sea here. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can knock some politicians down. Going to talk about today. Um, Pierre wanted me to talk mainly about the health effects of, of uh, the consequences of the pollution of the Irish Sea, which I've had quite a lot to do with. I've been involved in some court cases in Ireland, and I was uh, funded by the Irish government too to look into the health effects. So I'm going to talk a bit about that. Okay. So I'm going to talk a bit about that. Um, but I want to say a few things to start off with, uh, which have occurred to me as a result of listening to the eminent speakers that have come before me. And also, I want to give you a little bit of good news, too. Um, in this game, you know, and I've been in this game for a long time now, um, there's not a lot of good news. What we see is we see people who are making reasonable arguments, who are consistently showing that the evidence from um, the authorities is bunk, is nonsense, is, is even mathematically stupid, um, and yet they continue to produce their arguments and continue to build their power stations and, and, and so forth, which is very depressing, I think you will all agree. So there are two bits of good news. The first, the first is that um, I'm, I, I, I've been working in America a lot in, on court cases, and in America they have these lawyers who pursue uh, large companies in order to make huge sums of money. They're, they're called ambulance chasers. And they're, they're kind of like, um, they're a bit like uh, uh, outlaws in many ways. But what they do succeed in doing is attacking the nuclear industry and attacking people who are causing pollution uh, and killing children, killing adults. And I, I've been working as an expert witness for these people, which is very stressful, but also quite lucrative. Uh, and also, we're winning cases now, because when you get the arguments that, that, we were been to that we've all been talking about for many years, the scientific arguments, when we take them on, on the level of science, and we get these arguments in front of juries, and actually, they don't usually allow the argument to get to the jury because they don't want the publicity, so they usually settle out of court before it ever gets to the jury, but I can tell you that they, they are settling out of court. They're, they're realizing that they're not going to be allowed to, 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 they cannot permit these arguments to go before legal cases because the legal cases will then be lost and then the, and then the publicity will result in everybody knowing 
that their arguments are spurious and that they're empty and that they're worthless. And, another, and there's another point here too. I, last year I was invited to Kuala Lumpur by the ex-president uh, and we set up a war crimes tribunal for Tony Blair and for um, George W. Bush. Um, and as part of that, I was pursuing the idea of criminalizing scientific um, bias. Um, because it seemed to me then, and it still seems to me now, that in a court of law, if you give false evidence, then you can be um, sent to jail for perjury. And yet, consistently, we see scientists operating for the nuclear industry and for governments consistently giving false evidence, and I think in many cases knowing that they're giving false evidence, mm -hmm. creating stupid models that, that can be dismantled by anybody, a school child very often mm -hmm. can be dismantled and shown to be wrong. Now these people are responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of people by giving this false evidence. Since 1952 and, and the increasing pollution of the planet from these radioactive substances and from uranium, as I will explain, um, millions of people have died prematurely. Millions of people. And this is a much larger uh, health um, scandal, public health scandal, um, than, than, than the, the, the Holocaust. You know, we, we are inclined to believe that the most terrible things that happened on the planet are the things that were done by the Germans in the Second World War and various other war crimes like that. But the war crime associated with, it, it, with, with underpinning a, an operation that has killed millions of people in horrible ways by lying about the effects of low-level radiation, these people should be sent to jail. Mm. At very minimum, they should be criminalized. So I wanted to say that before mm. I started. The second thing I wanted to say is that in the last 10 years, I've been more and more interested in uranium. Mm. And I've been doing a lot of research on uranium, which has culminated in about 2003, 2004, discovering that there's a completely new way in which uranium can, can be considered to be hazardous. It, uranium is radioactive, we all know, but it's very weakly radioactive. And, and in the depleted uranium area, or in the area of uranium mining, the authorities will say, oh, it's, it's not much of a hazard because it has a very long half-life and its radioactivity is very, very low. And there are various arguments we can, we, can, we can manifest in opposition to that. We can say it's an alpha emitter and it's inside you and it has all these properties of attacking local tissue and so forth. But there's another way in which uranium harms people and that is through the amplification of natural background radiation. And I eventually managed, with much fighting, with an enormous amount of aggro, and if I look tired, it's because I am. <laughs> um, I, I have managed to get this now involved at the highest level. The International Commission on Radiological Protection has put three people onto studying this idea, uh, which is a fairly simple idea. It's fairly easy to understand. And um, it, it was really, it, the story was released in uh, the New Scientist last week, and I brought some, I brought some cop photocopies of the New Scientist article, which I've left at the back. And if they're not enough, I've got some more as well. But I'm going to give another talk on Friday in the evening, where I'll talk more about this this um, this this theory. Anyway, the point about uranium is this: it is the blood supply of the nuclear industry. And it has to be mined, it has to be pulled out of the ground. And the largest producer of uranium is Arriba. And most of the uranium is in Canada. And now, when they pull this stuff out of the ground, the ground in these areas usually belongs to um, local people, ethnic tribes people. In America, what we used to call the Red Indians, but as a member of the Green Party, I'm no longer allowed to call them that. Um, but you know what I mean. And these people are, are opposed to uranium mining, and they have, they have the rights associated with these bits of land, these tracts of land. And perhaps you have the same thing in northern Finland as well. They, these primitive people have rights, or primitive people, ha ha, have rights. And so if you take the laws that uh, allow these people to object to particular operations carrying out, then you can, you can put these laws in opposition to the uh, endeavors of com big companies like Arriba. And let's not forget, this is the French, basically the French state. Yeah. The, it, the French state is the nuclear state, and Arriva are now trying to export the Frenchification of energy all over the world. And so they are the enemy. And perhaps we can use this new uranium idea 
in courts to prevent them taking this stuff because there are laws encapsulated in uratum. And the uratum laws say that you cannot have more than a certain amount of radiation in a year, one millisievert. Or from, from one operation, it's actually one tenth of a millisievert. Now, if the uranium in your body is increasing the natural background radiation dose by the amount that I'm almost certain that it is, and we've modeled this using a big program from CERN called Fluca, then you have an explanation for all of the depleted uranium effects that have been observed in Iraq and in the soldiers, but you also have explanations for the uranium effects in the Navajo Indians mm -hmm. and in other people who have been associated with mining. And these effects have always been discounted on the basis that the dose of radiation is too low. But if the uranium is absorbing natural background radiation and re-emitting it into the DNA as photoelectrons, then the dose is very high. And they cannot argue that this dose is not very high because it's just standard physics, you understand? And so if that dose is higher than the amount that they are allowed to give you under the present uratum regulations, then that's it. They're finished. So this is a good way in. So I, I advise you to use this as a weapon. I have forged this weapon. It's, it's made of gold and platinum and jewels, precious stones, and you can kill them with it. Anyway, let's go on to Celepi, right? Um, Oh yes, well this is the other you see here that I'm a professor, <coughs> this is very impressive. Uh, I, uh, I, I was a visiting lecturer at the University of Liverpool and the American nuclear industry got really upset because this gave me some credibility in the American courts. So they contacted the Liverpool <coughs> University and they kicked me out. So I, I, was, I was no longer even uh, associated with the university. And you know, in the world at the moment, unless you're associated with the university, you don't exist. You know, you're just an activist. You can't be a scientist. So anyway, luckily, the University of Ulster, which is kind of a reasonable <laughs> university, they decided to make me a professor. So hey, look at that. Anyway, isn't that impressive? It impresses me. <coughs> All right. And now I've got lots and lots of slides here, but I know there's not enough time. So I want to sort of... You'll have to stop. somebody will have to wave at me and say how we'll much time, time there is, okay? Because I wasn't sure who I was going to talk to, you know, it could have been people who knew nothing about radiation. It seems to me most of you know everything about radiation, so I don't have to go too too deeply into into the radiation itself and what it is and how it works. I, I, I really just want to talk to you about the consequences for people who live near coasts that are contaminated with material from, from, from fission products, and uranium, in fact, it, it now turns out. Um, the summary of my argument is here, is that the childhood cancer, and I'm talking about nearly all childhood cancer now, incidentally, um, is, I believe, caused by internal exposure to no novel man-made radioactive isotopes and also to uranium. And in fact, as I'll show in a graph later on, if you were to plot, if you were to plot the world uranium production, or the world radium production, which amounts to the same thing, from about 1900 onwards, you will get a perfect correlation with the increase in childhood leukemia. Childhood leukemia is a new disease, incidentally. It, it's a disease which appeared at the beginning of this century, and it has its peak. Last century. Last, last century, sorry, <laughs> yes, no. <laughs> Uh, and it has its peak in the in the naught to naught to four year old. So as 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 a kind of disease, it's it's novel, and that increase, which went has just gone up and up and up and up, and is still increasing, um, is associated with the world production of uranium. Now the second point is that the model that currently underpins the operation of the nuclear industry is the model of the International Commission on Radiological Protection. And it averages doses over the whole of, of large masses. The dose is energy per unit mass. So there's a huge error inside the present risk model. Um, now, the, at the same time, there have been reports since 1982 of childhood leukemia increases near nuclear sites. Uh, and it began with the, with the observation of the Sellafield leukemia cluster in 1983. And there was a, a, a public inquiry about that. And of course, the nukes, nuclear um, industry and their uh, risk model friends came along and said, well, the doses were too low. So this was the first suggestion that you had a complete, a complete opposition between what in science we would call deductive logic and inductive logic. 
in, in scientific philosophy, you always use inductive logic. So you look at all the th events that might occur, and you look to see what is common between those events, and that's probably the cause of the events. That's the philosophy of science. That's how it works. That's how it's worked since, since it was first started in the, in the 12th century. Nevertheless, what we have with the nuclear logic is we have deduction. They say, here are some people who are Japanese survivors of a huge atomic bomb, and they received this dose, and this is the number of cancers they got, and now these people have got tiny, tiny doses compared to that, so therefore if they've got cancer, it cannot be caused by the radiation. Now this is complete nonsense. This is philosophically nonsense. And this is a good way to attack them in court, incidentally, because the, the people in court like logic. You know, that's how they operate. So if you can, if you can start talking about Francis Bacon and and, uh, and Descartes and you know Schopenhauer and so on, I mean, they love it because they don't understand all this science stuff. You know? And in fact, I was in an American court in Kentucky where the case was thrown out, incidentally. And the, and the judge came in and he said, hey, in Kentucky, we don't worry about this science stuff. We just do what is right. Okay, so, and then now, so to prove that that is the case, not only were all these nuclear sites producing childhood leukemias, and in fact, recently, last year, there was a huge study by the Germans um, who looked at all of the nuclear plants in Germany. Of course, they can do that now because the Germans don't want any more nuclear power, you see, so they can get away with that. And the Greens forced them to do this, the Green Party. Um, and so they discovered that there was a, a, a big increase in childhood leukemia in children living within five kilometers of the plant. And this has also been discovered in, in Cap de la Hague. And, and of course, Stella Field, and we found it at all the masts. And more or less everywhere that you look near a nuclear power station, you file, find childhood leukemia increases. And it, now the point is that we know what the doses are to those children in terms of conventional doses. They've been studied, I mean, right back in 1983, when the British started to, first were saying that the doses were too low, they knew what the doses were. So in order for those to be causal, in order for the leukemias to be caused by those doses in terms of the current risk model, the model has to be out by a factor of about 400 to 1,000 times. It varies depending upon the nuclear site, but particularly Sellafield is a very dirty one. However, there have been increases in infant leukemia published in, in, uh, in the literature by four different groups of scientists from America, from Greece, from Germany, which show that there is in fact an increase in infant leukemia only in those children who were in the womb at the time of the Chernobyl accident. Now those children, we know what their doses were and there's nothing else that could have occurred to them which would have caused leukemia. And that also shows this error of approximately the same number. So we can say that for external and internal radiation there's a mistake in terms of the dose response, the dose and the, and the, the, the cancers of, of up to a thousand times. And of course this has serious consequences for children and adults living near the Irish Sea, and of course it will be children and adults living near the Baltic. But you will never know. And the reason you will never know is because the cancer <coughs> registries are in on this scam. The cancer registries are being controlled to prevent data coming out to small areas. We all know that there's a cancer epidemic. Everybody knows somebody who's dying of cancer or has died of cancer, loved ones. Children are dying of cancer, budgerigars and fish and uh, dogs and cats. Everybody's dying of cancer. Now why? Well, we know also that cancer is a genetic disease and so there's uh, these genetic diseases uh, that cause cancer are entirely environmental. The studies have been done with, uh, with identical twins and they've, they've been able to show that the, the genetic component of most cancers is less than 10%, which means that the cancers are caused by 90% by non-genetic or environmental influences. In fact, I wrote a book about this called Wolves of Water, which, which has some flyers for it at the back of that. So, if you want to know what's causing the cancer, you, what you do is you look at, at epidemiology. You try to find the place, places in the world where the cancer rates are high, and then you try to look what is there in that place that might be causing that cancer. Because if the cancer increase in England and Wales is 30% greater in 1990 than it is in 1970, 30% increase, and probably here as well, I think, I think I know that it's here as well, it's the same, because I've looked at it before, then something caused that cancer, and it has to be some genetic mut mutagen, something which creates genetic defects, which in, in, in entered the world environment about 20 years before the, the cancer increased. 
and then and then you have to look to see where the cancer increase is greater and see whether the, whether whatever it is that's, that's greater there than where it's lower is something that could cause the cancer. Actually, the answer is simple. It's, it's radioactivity, and the radioactivity is from the weapons fallout originally from the global nuclear testing. And then it was uh, added to by all of these games that they're playing with nuclear power stations and reprocessing plants and so on, La Hague, Dunre, Sellafield. I have to tell you a story about La Hague, incidentally. Um, they have these big tanks which they have to keep cool with ha have all the nuclear waste inside them. In 1998, I was told by this guy, um, in connection with this Irish case, that uh, they have to, uh, if they don't, they have to have backup generators to cool these things. You see, because if they if they don't, because they're so hot that they evaporate quite quickly, and if, if the water evaporates, they can get to critical mass, and then they can go bang. And now this actually happened in 1957 in Kishtim in, in Russia, and it just spread nuclear waste everywhere. Now in, in, in Sellafield there are about 25 of these tanks and each one contains about the equivalent um, uh, amount of the Chernobyl accident that, that went everywhere, okay? So any one of these can go bang. And there are a lot of these in Cap de la Hague in the Cotentin Peninsula in north of France, you see. So in 1997, the electricity failed, poof. Then they went to the standby generator but it wouldn't start, okay? Right. So they had to get. In, so they were panicking, and everyone was fleeing. You know, they're, they're all, the, the, all the roads were blocked. Everyone was running and trying to get away from Capital Aha because they knew what would happen. And uh, they, tried, they they sent off for a spare generator to try and you know cool it all down. And they were road, and the roads were blocked and this and that. And luckily, the electricity came back on again. And what happened? It came. It went. It went off, and then it came on again while the generator had started. This is what happened. So that so the electricity went off. Generator cut in, electricity came back on and blew all the blew all the fuses that because of, because of the various systems that were involved in cooling it, the generator system and the main system, and the, and so it cut out and the generator packed up. So so this can happen. It almost happened in La Hague in 1997, and that was another one of these tanks that would have gone poof. Okay. Well, I'm not going to go into all of this. This is the graph here, incidentally, of childhood leukemia against radium production. Okay. And this is from 1920, 1940, 1960. You can see that the increase in radium production and, and, childhood, and childhood leukemia more or less follow, them, follow each other. And this is the proof that I mentioned to you about Chernobyl. This is, the, this is a graph of the cesium-137 from Chernobyl as measured in whole body measurements of human <coughs> beings taken at Harwell. So you can see actually that the cesium got into the people and it lasted quite a long time. This second bump here is because winter silage, that's the grass, you know, it was cut in the summer, it was contaminated and then it was fed to the animals in the winter time and so it went, came back into the milk. So if we want to look at this period here, that's the period that people were contaminated. And these are the numbers of, child, of infant leukemias here in two, two year age groups from 1975 to 1994 and you can see there is a significant increase in infant leukemia. And infant leukemia is, the, is, is, in, is leukemia in, uh, in children who are in the first year of life. And these are plotted, these are plotted in terms of their, their, their period of time in the womb. We can work out what their doses were. And we got this error in the risk model of, of about 400 times. So we're going to sell a field now. This is an earlier version of myself in, in, in my mag magic jacket. Oh, no, the same cap. The yeah, the same hat. The hat is the trademark. If I take off the hat, which I have to do in court, incidentally, <laughs> they, they, they don't know who I am. And, uh, I, met, I met this woman. I met this woman in Bristol, and she said, "Oh yes, I saw your colleague in court. You know, he was really very good." <laughs> I said, "Yes, that's my brother." Um, okay, so so this is my this is my uh, you know. Um, an activist hat, yeah, that's right. Okay, and the TV people, they're always asking me to take it off, you know, and I never do, because I said nobody will recognize me. <laughs> okay, well, you all know about, and I've more or less said, said, said what's, what, what the situation is with Sellafield. Sellafield is the largest producer of radioactive fission product waste, and also uranium, incidentally, which it knocks about one ton of uranium into the sea every year, into the Irish Sea, uh, in the whole of Europe. It's a massive, massive source of this stuff. And after the weapons fallout, after the, the fallout pollution contaminated the entire planet, Sellafield um, certainly took over 
And in the 70s, it was creating vast, vast amounts of material. Um, and these are, the, these are the various leukemia clusters that have been discovered. This is taken from the, uh, the book, book, the European Committee on Radiation Risk uh, book, which we published in 2003. I started, this is the other thing I say to people, is, is create alternative institutions, you know? Um, because what you realize is that it's like the film The Wizard of Oz. The world is like the Wizard of Oz, you know? And so these people, they create their institutions, the, in, the International Commission on Radio, you know, and the United Nations Scientific... Well, to hell with them, you know? We can make our own ones. We can make the Stockholm Convention Committee. And, uh, you know, you just yeah. make the name up. Do anything you like. See? Yeah, and you can make your conventions and so on. So we created this thing called the European Committee on Radiation Risk, and it was so successful. I'm now being asked by the British government to advise them on radioactive waste disposal. No? What a laugh. So okay, this, is, this is from the book. Uh, um, and we go into court and we get this book and we say, yes, this is the European... Co and of course they try to say that we're not official. But the point is they're not official either, you see, because they have to be independent. So, they're, so they're, they have to be very careful about saying that we're not official. They have to say that we're not considered to be right by most scientists. They have to reduce it to that. And then we ask them which scientists, you see. So then, so this, this, you can have a lot of fun with alternative institutions. Let me suggest this system to you. So you can see here that there have been childhood leukemia clusters discovered, like I said, in nearly every nuclear site where it's been looked at. So let's come back to the Irish Sea. The point about the Irish Sea, and in fact the Baltic is worse in this regard, because you can see here in the Irish Sea there's a gap at the bottom here. There's not much of a gap at the top. So all the crap that you put in the Irish Sea more or less stays there unless it's soluble in seawater. If it's soluble in seawater or if it's in fine enough particles and it can float away with the tides, it does so. But it's a, it's a measure of the extraordinary quantities that, that, that of, of radioactivity that they put in the Irish Sea that this stuff is found in the North Cape, it's found in, the, in, in, in Oslo, it's found all, all up the coast of Norway, it's found in the fish. Um, from, from uh, the, 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 the Newfoundland banks. It, it's everywhere, it's everywhere, this radioactivity. It has very long half-life, a lot of it, too. And it turns up in odd places, too. Very strange. Um, see, when they first decided to start to use the sea as a repository, they said, oh, well, it's okay, you know, it just goes away. The sea is very big, after all, you throw stuff in the sea, it all goes away. So they just hoped that it would go away. Problem is, it doesn't go away. It concentrates in the intertidal sediment and so anywhere that you have fine sediment, so if you go to an inlet and you put your hand down and you come up and you go like this and it's like slimy, it's very, very fine particles, you can be sure that that's where the radioactivity is. And people who live near there are, are in danger. This is an example of the mudflats here at Carlingford in, north, in the northern part of Ireland. And there's huge amounts of radioactivity. This is on the other side. This is 100 miles away from Sellafield. But because this inlet is an area of low tidal energy, so the tide doesn't go fast, it comes in very slowly like this. And then it goes out again very slowly. And this gives the time for all the little particles to, to, to fall out, you see. And, and so if you go here and you tread in it, you go up to about there in the mud. I've done a lot of this mud hopping. Um, and I, uh, so there was a... That, that, the initial analysis of this area showed that there was a, an excess of child leukemia in this area. And we had to get the data from a local GP because, of course, again, the cancer registries will not give you the data. And this is probably true in Sweden as well. If you go to the Swedish cancer registry, you say, I want data down to the small areas, they'll say no. They'll say confidentiality. It's nonsense. The reason is they don't want you to know where the cancers are. If you were to find that they were all along the coast, like I have, then people would be upset, naturally. You know, it would, the house prices would change, you know, nobody would want to go on holiday and swim in the sea. It would be a bad scene for, for, for the economic system. Well, this is a, a load of stuff which I don't expect you to read. Um, but what we did, between 1997 and 2000, we analyzed a huge amount of data that was leaked to us from the Wales Cancer Registry. Um, and, the, and sh shortly after it was leaked to us, the cancer registry was closed down. Um, and everybody was sacked. The whole lot just phew, gone, you know? Because they knew that the cat was out of the bag. And then there was a new cancer registry came in, some new guy. And he said, oh, well, this was all data that was um, uh, erroneous. You know, there was a mistake. 
the children with leukemia were actually adults, and in fact they weren't ill anyway, you know, they, they just happened to fall onto the piece of paper or something, who knows. This chap, incidentally, we have, uh, as I will tell you, they, um, he, we've shopped him up to the British Medical Association. So we're ta we take action against these guys. You know, he, he's a biased scientist in the, in the pay of the government or covering up or whatever it is. You know. I, I gave a talk at the Royal Society in November of last year about scientific fraud. And so I put these names up. So I, 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 three or four people I put up as scientific fraudsters. And we can prove that they're fraudsters. And this, this guy is one of them. So I'll show you what we found briefly, because this is, this is the important message for this meeting now, because you're considering the possibility of citing some kind of reprocessing facility uh, or post-spallation reprocessing facility along a coast which is already contaminated as a result of the Chernobyl radiation coming out and stellar field and, and everything else. So these were the small areas that we looked at. That each one of those areas, it's, quite a, it's not a very highly populated country, Wales, but about three million people. And some of these areas are smaller than others. These are towns, for example. But as a result of, of, of having figures from 1974 to 1990, we can collect these together and, and we can then measure the levels of, rate of, of, uh, of cancer by distance from the coast. And what we found was quite extraordinary at the time. We never expected to find this. You know? we, we thought that it, there might be an effect, but we didn't realize how, how close the effect was. The effect is very, very close to the coast. It's within one kilometer of the coast, you get a sudden increase in cancer. This is for all malignancies. And each one of these represents one of those small areas. And if you take the different kinds of cancers together and you plot them as, a, as an exponential, uh, if you do an exponential model, um, that's you're modeling them, them as now as if they were going to be higher, close to the coast, which you've already found. You find that there's a highly statistically significant effect for all kinds of cancers. And it was driven by high risks in the North Wales towns, which were close to areas of, of high levels of plutonium. Because these, 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 uh, these samples were all measured, you know, the radiological protection authorities in my country and the Ministry of Agriculture, they measure the concentrations of these radioactive substances in the mud. Of course, the levels are quite small in terms of overall doses, but as I've said, these doses are really meaningless because we're talking about internal radiation. But these people eat fish more than others. Have you checked uh, the difference? Yes, then? yes. The people near the coast do eat fish more than others, and shellfish as well. So you can get this stuff inside the shellfish. That's true. But we have another explanation for this, which I'll, which I'll, I'll come to. And this is in the children. So we've got childhood cancer in this period as well. Also very high, close to the coast, you see. And of course, Sellafield is close to the coast. So what I'm, I'm suggesting is that, in fact, the Sellafield leukemia cluster was caused by proximity to the coast. And when they had a legal case in 1993, which they lost, they lost it on the basis, interestingly, that there were high levels of childhood cancer close to the coast and not close to Sellafield. And they said, therefore, it's not an effect due to radiation. <laughs> but of course, but then the, the, you see, the lawyers at that time, they, 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 they were trying to prove that it was the parental exposure, it was the exposure to the fathers that was the cause of the childhood leukemia. And because there were some children that were um, not, whose fathers were not in the nuclear industry and lived up the coast, that, that the case was lost. Um, and this is true for brain tumors as well. So there's the brain tumors um, graph. I'll gallop through all of this. All of this stuff, incidentally, is in this book, Wolves of Water, which the flyer is there. So if any of you are interested, this is the biggest source of all this data. I've put absolutely everything in there. But I've also put in some nice pictures and little asides and a few poems and some songs. And you know, and you can stand on it, and it makes you two inches higher. <laughs> <laughs> so there are lots of reasons for buying that book, which is quite cheap, too, because it was, uh, it was uh, funded by a charity. So. So that's the basic message, that there was an increased risk. Now, the Welsh Office and the Committee on Medical Aspects of Radiation and Environment attacked me, of course, joined the queue. Um, and uh, this new cancer registry, WCISU, said that, they were, that, said that we were wrong, uh, but they didn't release any of the data backing up their claims. They said this was confidential. So, of course, with these cancer registries, what they do is they just say, hey, there's no problem. And you say, well, can we see the numbers? Say, hey, you can't. And so you have to rely on them being telling the truth, which we don't. Because wherever we go and look, we find
our problems. Now, actually, what happened was that the Welsh television company, who were interested about this debate, you know, is there a high level of leukemia? Isn't there a high level of leukemia? Busby says this, they say that, they say he's a nutcase, he says they're crooks. <laughs> Who's right? Okay. So, so these people, Twelly Griffiths and Linda Perry, they actually went and knocked on doors up in North Wales, and they said, "Have you got childhood leukemia in the house?" You see, and they did. They found them. They found the children. They found them. We've got their names and addresses and everything. And from and, and this was an update now. So from we got from 2000 to 2003, we found a 21-fold excess. So never mind about the Sellafield leukemia cluster where it's a 10-fold excess. Now we've got a 21-fold excess and an 18-fold excess of brain tumors in this little area where the radiation ends up, okay? So they can't, and they're the children, they're their names. Kemlin, Chelsea, Ryan, Ruth, Lee Thomas, Rhys, Max, Klinos, Gareth, they're all there, and that's where they live, you see? So, we, so there's no argument about this now, but of course there was. So the, the, Wells, the Wells Cancer Registry, was, the, the new one, was sent off to, to, to do some sums, and they said, oh, well, we've got the populations wrong. So although there are all these leukemias, we agree that there are leukemias. Actually, there are lots more children than Busby thought there was. You see. So this was another argument. Anyway, we resolved that argument too. So all the arguments are resolved now. They're wrong. I'm right. And they've been shopped up to the authorities. And the British Medical Association is investigating. Well, we'll you know, don't hold your breath. <laughs> anyway, that's what's happening. Um, and they haven't taken me to court, and I've, 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 told, I've put everywhere around in the media, said that they're a bunch of crooks, and this guy's a crook, and this is his name, and go and throw things at him, and so on. And <laughs> no, he hasn't sued me, uh, because he knows I'm right, and he doesn't want to get into court. Now, here's the explanation. The gentleman here talking about fish. Actually, this graph here is taken from a, a, a publication in the 1980s, um, from some people at Harwell who went along with big sheets and they hung these sheets up on the coast and they moved in all inland and put some more sheets up and so on. And then they measured the sheets to see how much plutonium was on the sheet, you see. Uh, like a bed sheet, a big piece of cloth, yeah? Um, and uh, they found that this is a logarithmic graph, see? So this goes 1, 10, 100, 10, 100, 1,000, okay? So these are the concentrations of plutonium on these sheets as you go inland so many kilometers. And you can see that all the, all the plutonium is in the first one kilometer. And it's inhaled. The, the children inhale it, the parents inhale it, it's there. And in fact, if you live near the sea, which I do, and I guess some of you do as well, you know that sometimes when the wind blows, you get your car is covered with salt crystals, you know, and you have to clean the car. The window is covered with sort of dirty, dirty salt crystals. And this is where this stuff comes from. And this is a mud core taken from near Sellafield, and you can see, that, and then it's put in a core, you cut, you cut a, uh, you put a pipe into the mud, and then you freeze it, and then you cut it, and then you put a photographic plate there. And you can see, this is the, these are the, the alpha emitters, um, the, the particles of alpha emitters, which are there. So that's the explanation for the curious, sharp decrease in, because you see, if it was just the fish, you're not going to get people only in one kilometer eating the fish, you know. Mm -hmm. That you get people along the whole coast eating the fish, and actually people quite far inland as well. Um, and so, and also we've done studies with fish eaters, which doesn't suggest that there's a problem with fish eaters. And actually, a lot of this stuff comes right inland. This is a fresh. This is a mussel. Uh, uh, this one. This is a cross section of auto radiograph. I've got to finish now, have I? Okay. Well, all right. Well, I can gallop through this, but this is this is radioactivity in the muscle from one of these particles. I think I have covered it, really. Oh yes, this one here. This one is um, this is uh, plutonium in sheep droppings by distance, distance from from the coast, right the way across the whole country. So you can see this stuff goes quite far. Now, what else is there? Supporting evidence: child leukemia. Well, we found child leukemia in Scotland as well. And uh, around the nuclear site at Bradwell, we found increase of weight breast cancer. This is in that picture I showed you earlier with the mud. This is the cancer rates. We looked at, we actually asked, this was the IRA, I think, asked this. We're in Northern Ireland, the provisional IRA people went and knocked on doors for me. Hmm. And they asked how many people had cancer in the various <coughs> houses. Of course, everybody answered, you know, because they, <coughs> you don't, don't answer these people. <laughs> Uh, and, the, and so this, is, this has had a 95% response rate. This, this, this was the most amazing uh, response rate of any study ever done, I think. Um, I don't think they actually had pistols on them, but you know. 
<laughs> anyway, so you can see it's all along the coast by the mud flats is the cancer. So that's the problem that you have here. The Hinkley Point, we also, this is Hinkley Point, discharging into the sea. This is a power station in, in Somerset. Uh, and you can see also big mud flats here, all along here. There's a huge cancer, excess childhood leukemia, um, adult cancers and so on, breast cancer mainly there. And so, yeah, okay, so the conclusions uh, I've got here, which is that the increase in childhood leukemia and other cancer primarily caused by exposure to internal radionuclides. The model used to underpin the operation of the nuclear uh, uh, plants and their discharges are wrong by, by large amounts. And uh, it, that's clear in Chernobyl studies. The current cancer epidemic in adults has the same principal cause. And coastal populations near fission product and uranium contaminated sediment suffer excess risks. And you'll find that here as well. Okay? <laughs> You have this on your home page and what well, I'll picture. Well, <laughs> no, um, well, well, I mean, uh, the, the whole. Uh, yes, if you, if you want more information on this, there's a lot of it on the page, uh, on the home page of the low level radiation campaign. Um, so we have it in our newspaper. Which you have, yeah, okay, which, is, which is here, LLRC.org. Yeah. And I've also, a lot of my papers are on this one called Green Orbit. Yeah. It's a newspaper. Yeah. This newspaper here okay. has two articles. One from the new scientist that was supposed to be published, yeah. okay. and, uh, and uh, some website. more here. And yes. Yeah. So get the magazines from the table so you can continue. Pekita Müller from Helsingborg, uh, Green Party camp campaigner. <laughs> decisions, uh, where is the level of decision making, and uh, what, are, what are regulating these things. So I was uh, looking at first into the Lisboa Treaty, but uh, I was uh, looking a bit into the Lis Lisbon Treaty and Euratom Treaty uh, to get uh, some ideas about these things. And uh, I wanted to show, uh, first thing, uh, Sweden's, uh, what we, what we um, pay to this um, Euratom budget. As you can see, it's uh, about 5 billion in, in uh, 2006. Swedish crowns, of course, but still, you can see it's in, in the increase here. Ten million. Yeah. 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 You can ask uh, um, why it's increasing like this. And we're still, <coughs> we're still only in 2006 here. Yeah. Uh, one odd thing that uh, we have uh, noticed is that. Um, Euratom is officially superior to the European Union. And that's uh, a new article uh, in the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, nobody knew this before. It's very odd, but it's clear. You can see it here for yourselves. And uh, what I was uh, thinking about was, uh, should a small country like Sweden uh, deal with big issues like this ESS project. Uh, and I, well, you have to, to think about that for yourselves, but um, the 
the Lisbon Treaty, uh, this is Article 2. It uh, says that the member states are entitled to the allocated rights of decision making only if <laughs> the union does not. Oh. And this is uh, shared decision making. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course the member states may again, only the language tells you what it's all about, they may again use the allocated right of decision making. It's so odd, you, may, you don't believe it's true. That's subsidiarity, they call that. Mm. Yeah. Subsidiarity, and they yeah. tell us it's decentralization. Yeah. It's only decentralization if they haven't already decided. And this is shared <coughs> in their opinion, not in my understanding. And this one, your atomic uh, treaty. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to show who, who um, found it, what countries founded this. I guess you know, but um, still. Then, then, the task of the Europe Atom Treaty is of course a priority of nuclear power. And, and um, we all know that, promoting nuclear research facilitating investments uh, and uh, that makes me uh, ponder about uh, uh, what investments do they put in, in um, Sweden now in uh, uranium mining and what, uh, what uh, investments do they put in this ESS project uh, I think we have to find out Article 3, it's, yeah, it's this new one. I have to put it over again because it's so odd. I, I was so astonished to see it. I, I never thought it could be That's like right. this. It, it's so can curious. You read, can, you read, can you read it? Yeah, well, it, it's, uh, it's that um, the European Union uh, is uh, really, um, what do you say? It, it's uh, your atom is superior to the European Union. Yeah, the tasks entrusted to the Europe, your atom community, yeah, from the your atom community, shall be carried out by the following institutions. And then it, it's uh, they entrust. Uh, the European Parliament, the Council, uh, uh, the Commission, a Court of Justice, a Court of Auditors, but a court, but this court, uh, would I, I think uh, the, the, it's only uh, living in the text. It doesn't exist. They use the ordinary EG court. But, uh, but in the in the text, it's like this from the start up till now. It's still there. I don't know why. Because with every new treaty, they change this euro tone, and that shows as well that it it's in the treaties. Not as I say, it doesn't belong to the treaties, but it does because they change it in every treaty. They change the euro tone treaty. No, it hasn't been uh, uh, treated. It uh, continues as a protocol. Uh, uh, yes, but, uh, yes, uh, but the I, new uh, treaty. I know, but uh, now so it's uh, an annex. The European treaty is one of the founding treaties of uh, the European Community. Yes, it but has been uh, unchanged for unchanged. almost 50 yes, years. Yes, but my my uh, um, my aspect is why? How can can they change? Uh, in um, when they change uh, the, those treaties, how can they change the Euro, Euro Atom Treaty if it doesn't belong? If it doesn't, it, it can be uh, changed by an intergovernment uh, conference in uh, well, it with un un uh, well, they don't. between all the member states. That's a problem because uh, yeah. obviously some member states. Then it's uh, the same thing, uh, and they yes, just or, don't want to admit it. Or uh, every member state can uh, unilaterally uh, withdraw from the Eurotum uh, Treaty under the Vienna uh, Treaty on, uh, on, on uh, Convention on Treaties. Uh, that's, that uh, was uh, recently proved by uh, 
But that's democratic bluff because they will never do. There is no country, okay, even if a majority. Well, they're, they're working in Austria to do it. Yeah, in, in, in uh, well, this uh, Article 6 is, uh, of course, about uh, encourage research programs, uh, research and training programs. Uh, for every uh, every kind of, um, of research, of course. Uh, in the, even in the search of, uh, or particularly in the fields of prospecting for minerals. Uh, so, uh, who knows uh, who are paying the research in Sweden and Finland, actually. I don't. Don't and that. there is another and a very um, important aspect of this, and that is access, access to supplies. And, and that, uh, under that uh, uh, Article 52, it, um, you are to learn that right of options on all source materials uh, in the and fissile materials produced in the territories of member states, uh, they are also exclusive right to conclude contracts. This is an agency that I never heard of before, but I started to scrutinize this text. Uh, there is an agency that, that is very powerful, Won't this mean that, that, that uh, uh, uranium will be mined everywhere in Sweden where it's uh, economically yeah. feasible yeah. in short time? We have no say. So no, no local veto will be respected no. if we accept this, this uh, treaty? Yeah, we have no well, uh, It should be mentioned that, that uh, one of the main reasons for, uh, the, uh, for, for the, the ability for, for every member of, of EU uh, to leave Evertum, you know, naturally, one of the reasons that was mentioned in this uh, uh, paper from the University of Nuremberg was that uh, most parts of the Evertum uh, Treaty did not enter into force as planned uh, by the developers of the Evertum Treaty. And uh, one of, of uh, we have to go on. Yes, but yeah, we but have especially the, com the common ownership of fissile material in uh, the EU has never entered into force, so this is actually uh, uh, just uh, uh, a paper tiger, according to... Uh, well, to paper the, tigers are not papers. Uh, I'm sorry, we don't have time for discussion, we have to wrap lots of countries. Up. We, we and they're signed by power. Sweden. <laughs> it's signed by Sweden. So uh, it's not a paper tiger to us. It's signed by Finland, so it's not a paper tiger to them. No, th this part of the euro to Niels, I'm it, sorry, it, but it, this is no force. discussion right now. She's having but it might tools. any time it's needed. <laughs> That's the way you, the EU functions. Well, Article 56 is extremely important. It states that member states shall be responsible for, responsible for ensuring that agency may operate freely in their territories. So there's not, not much we can do about it. Huh? I'm sorry. Authorization not granted when contract goes against interest of your atom community. I mean, uh, only by the language you can you can uh, tell what it's all about. Article three again. The Euratom Treaty uh, entitles uh, the commun European Union to do this. Prospecting, yeah? Oh, yeah. Uh, financial support to prospecting programs in the territories of the member states. We are talking about this agency again that nobody knows anything about. And uh, of course, uh, 
the, sh the member states shall submit annually to the Commission a report on the development of prospecting and production. So we're all under that agency. And uh, <coughs> yeah, it's, it's all over the same. It's recom recommend recommendations uh, are told uh, the member countries by this agency. Uh, and Well, they have the, the access to every source of, of um, materials that they want. Uh, do we know who is the leading, leading, uh, what do we say, decision makers in this area? It is a, you were told a, a combination of governments and, and private companies. No, 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 no. It's no. a treaty between Just countries, like the Lisbon yeah. Treaty. Yeah. But so it's it, a protocol. It, to in the conclusion, Lisbon where do you see the connection with the European Spedition Source and Eurotom? Are there any, in your opinion? Sorry? Is there any connection between uh, Eurotom and, uh, in your opinion, and the ESS in North? Yes. Where, where is the connection? I think there are. Uh, the connection is, is uh, like. Uh, what uh, decision making does Sweden have uh, in ESS project? And uh, is our role just to uh, uh, pay a lot for it? I, I think a small country like, I, I have a, a feeling, and I hope I'm right, <laughs> that we're just fooled to pay a lot for it. And we will never, uh, we will never have it. <laughs> I hope it's like that. Uh, because uh, they fooled our government uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, yeah, it was last year, to sign this paper on uh, to pay 30%. Well, it, is this is not mentioned in the Simmons uh, Framework uh, uh, Eurotom uh, program? No, but the Eurotom uh, the was, uh, uh, was uh, founded in 1957. So Thank you was, very much. We have to go on in our program. I just wanted you to start reading these texts of the Eurotone mm. yeah. and the new articles of the Lisbon Treaty. Just uh, think about it. Now I will introduce the chairman of our organization, the Swedish anti-nuclear movement, Jörn Bunze, who is also a type of energy professor has oh, been uh, okay. teaching the issues of energy. You and I have some good news for you. <laughs> uh, first, I'm just going to use three minutes because what I'm uh, going to say, I have written in this uh, paper, which you can uh, obtain on the top of the fire. Uh, secondly, uh, the good news are that nuclear power has never been so expensive as today. According to Moody's price index now, it's $7,500 per kilowatt, corresponding to production cost of a kilowatt hour, about one Swedish crown, or 10 EU cents. Uh, and if you compare that with the price of wind energy, which is very abundant, uh, the price of new wind energy, according to US sources, is about six American cents per kilowatt hour. That means less than half of nuclear. So if we only could create a market economy, nuclear power would be dead today mm. for economical reasons. Unfortunately, it's not so easy. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but basically, we cannot afford uh, nuclear energy. Uh, for, for economical reasons. Uh, and uh, I will finish with another thing uh, which uh, I thought about when I heard uh, previous presentations that uh, these complicated models uh, are usually very too complicated. It can actually be mathematically proven strictly that if you have five parameters, uh, that you really cannot, cannot verify. Uh, so 
precise, you can uh, write an elephant on a diagram. It means you can prove anything you want. And that's uh, the big problem with all these complicated computer models. They are so complicated, so uh, you cannot believe it. Uh, and that can be mathematically proven strictly, that you can't believe in them uh, if they have more than five parameters, or even five parameters, uh, which they cannot certainly verify. Don't believe them. Okay, so Linda. Okay, my name is Linda Birkedal, and I'm the president of the Lund Society for Nature Conservation. And we are a local branch of a national uh, NGO working with the nature and environment. And also, the national um, organization has decided that we don't want the ESS in Sweden, and we don't want it at all, because it's a great hazard to people and to environment. Uh, for our part, we have a special committee working on the ESS, and at the moment we are looking specifically into the uh, possibilities for us to handle this in a legal process, which we now see coming up. Um, and about our view on the ESS, we say that, of course, new knowledge research is important, interesting, exciting, and all of that. But it is not worth the risk <coughs> we see to the local society of Lund, but also uh, a lot of people around the Arizona region. And uh, our main concerns are Firstly, that the target they will use when they uh, have a proton beam, uh, the target they will use to get the neutron ray to look at the material they will study in this kind of big microscope, uh, it will be a heavy metal that is very, very dangerous. Uh, we have reason to believe that we, it will actually be mercury, but also the other alternatives they show are very dangerous. Um, we can say almost for sure that there will be either mercury or lead in the target. We also, from a local perspective, say that this land that they will use to build the facility can be of better use. Uh, it is a densely populated area uh, and they will risk the lives of many people and we could also use this land for better purposes. Uh, we are also worried about radiation and that there will be nuclear waste, although uh, and that is important, I think, it will not be, uh, there, there is no reason, or it's not on the same scale as a nuclear power plant. It is less dangerous uh, when it comes to radiation. And also the great energy demand worries us. And here we now can see that uh, uh, the ESS, they have, had to notice that there is a local opinion against the ESS uh, and because of that they have made a significant uh, effort to greenwash their uh, activities. Um, one way of doing that is claiming that this will be a CO2 neutral research facility. And that is during uh, the period when they are using it. Uh, we say that if that should be true, they should also do it when they build it. Mm. Uh, and we also say that uh, 
in our community, in the municipality, there has been a decision from the politicians that we need to reduce our um, emissions of uh, climate gases with 85% until 2050. And then we will need this alternative energy for other purposes. Um, I will focus a bit uh, also on this, these heavy metals. Uh, and it is and has for a long time been a very, very strict policy from the uh, Swedish government that these are phase-out substances. We shouldn't use lead, we shouldn't use mercury anymore. And that is within Sweden. They have also worked very, very hard uh, internationally to reach this in the European community and in the United <coughs> Nations. Yes, this is about bioaccumulation. Um, uh, both lead and mercury is bioaccumulating substances. And I won't describe it now because of the time shortage. But what about mercury? Why is it dangerous? What does it cause? It causes a lot of uh, damage to, to humans and also to animals. It will, um, and the first point I think is maybe the most severe. Uh, very, very low doses will cause uh, damage to the nervous system. And it will also cause problems in reproduction. Uh, children born uh, that when their mothers have been exposed to mercury, their brains will be damaged severely. And it could also mean uh, that people get sterile. How much mercury will be used? Uh, I was quoted here earlier today. It was almost correct. Uh, the highest number here, 60 tons, is if there are three goals uh, in this uh, research facility. What they say now is that there will be one, which is the lower number here, uh, 20 tons. Um, and that is a lot. 20 tons of mercury is a lot. When you look about uh, on uh, the hazard it puts upon people. Um, I don't think that they will actually dare to come up with the idea of Three, three targets because of the Sveso uh, directive. So uh, what we can see is either one, which is what they are saying now, but I believe that they uh, are just wanting not to scare people. Uh, so that it is very, very possible that there will be two. And this is one of the things that has been very, very typical during these years that the ESS has been on the agenda, that uh, the ESS Scandinavia is first giving one kind of information and then when we uh, ask them why are you having these dangerous plants, they change their mind. They say, oh, no, 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 we're not going to do it like this. We're going to do it like this instead a little less dangerous. And in some aspects, I think that it is actually uh, the case that our criticism uh, will make the facility less dangerous. But sometimes I think it's just uh, a facade. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Trick. That's right. Um, 
and this is about lead, which is one thing uh, that this is typically an example of this. We started criticizing uh, the use of mercury very heavily, and then they said, oh, no problem, we will use lead instead. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but um, yes, as you can see, lead is also a heavy metal, very, very dangerous. Um, and as I know that Boo has also uh, a lot of interesting uh, information, I think I will maybe uh, finish with, with <coughs> the la latest idea that is uh, a bit the other way around. Um, it ha has the exact site of this facility has been all of the time very close to Lund with a hundred thousand inhibit inhabitants, but also in the center of the Ørresund region. Uh, what they are doing in this case is not moving it further away from people, uh, but closer to people. That is horrible. Um, we thought it was too close already. Uh, and what we see here is the old suggestion about one kilometer from where people, a lot of people are living. But now it's moving closer to, uh, to about here instead. Um, so, I think that is maybe uh, some description of our work and the work of ESS Scandinavia. What we are doing now is uh, finding out how we should handle the process in court if it hopefully gets there and uh, the government doesn't just take it as their decision. Uh, and uh, one important part here now in the close future is that the municipality of Lund, uh, the health and environment department should force the ESS uh, to uh, to uh, have an environmental trial in court and to make a good environmental impact, impact assessment. Because as it's said now, uh, this facility is new, which means it's not in the Swedish law and we don't know how to handle it. Um, they say, okay, we will uh, make this voluntarily. But if they make it voluntarily, they can, can do it when half of the work is already done, when they have built half of the used ESS facility, uh, and look into the details they find interesting. The difference is huge to uh, the municipality of Lund forcing them to do it, because then they can say that the politicians of Lund, you need to do this before you start building and also point out what aspects, what environmental aspects do you have to look into. And that is a huge difference because this means you could actually say no. If you're halfway uh, through building it, <coughs> you have invested so much money <coughs> that also, no, is not really something you could expect. So, okay, thanks for your attention. I would like to introduce Mina Wiesmann, who is also from Lund, and uh, had done uh, many different things, but she formed, formed or initiated an uh, environmental green library in Lund. Hello, everybody. 
very tired now. It's a long listening, but it's uh, very exciting to uh, have somebody with us against the ESS. It is really a, a monstrous project. I don't see how all the political parties locally and nationally, except the Green Party, they are all very positive to this dangerous, expensive, and unnecessary project. So uh, we have made an appeal and published it in this uh, uh, environment magazine, in your magazine, and we have got quite a few names, not many enough. So we want to uh, ask you if you would like to sign this appeal against the ESS. You can find it on www.nuvinfo.se slash ESS protest. Or you can sign on this paper, back and front. I know that many of you have already signed, but we want all. Um, that is one thing that really has worried me very much, and that is um, that it's so quiet about very important criticism, like to students at the uh, Technical University in Lunde at the fire extinguishing in Lyon or whatever. They're going to be fire brigade uh, engineers. And they have said that there is <coughs> going to be mercury. And that must uh, not come into use because it uh, it must be forbidden by chemicale inspection, the chemical inspectorate. It should be replaced with something that is not dangerous. They are going to use um, hydrogen gas to cool it, and it's a very dangerous, easily inflammable gas, and it can make the whole thing explode. The ESS generates radiation, and after we have finally closed the Barsebeck reactor, we don't want another nuclear facility even closer to all the people in our city. So I think there is uh, very important uh, reasons to stop it. So please help us spread the message. and. Uh, Make people wake up. Here is the uh, appeal. If you would like to sign it, thank you. Half day, then a cut. So I will also cut that near in the English. Yeah, and the rear of the hair. English, please. Oh, sorry. English, please. Cut. <laughs> I have shortened <coughs> a little bit what I was going to say. I will come back where I finished before. Uh, and uh, <coughs> we, we will just Just look a little bit into the details of uh, <coughs> the target <coughs> and what is going on there in this ESS uh, facility. Uh, last time I told, uh, or earlier today, I told you about fission taking place inside this reactor. Of course, this is not the main process, but the ESS Scandinavia completely denies that there is fission taking place in this reactor. And the reason why is, uh, why they are so sensible to this little issue is that uh, it could be classified as a nuclear uh, facility if it is like this. And I will show you that's, that it is the case. Here is a picture 
from what is some of the compounds formed during fission reactions inside the mercury target. You recognize iodine, some of them uh, isotypes that are uh, radioactive. And uh, you, as you know, maybe this is what one thing uh, you fear when there are atomic bombs or uh, accidents in nuclear reactors that iodine will escape and it is uh, concentrated in the human uh, glands. And of course there are some isotopes from mercury. Gold is also formed. Interesting. But uh, it shows anyway that uh, in some uh, fission is taking place inside the reactor. This is a picture from the American uh, SNS. And uh, <coughs> here is when they open up and are going to change a uh, piece of the target, target. This piece here is possible to empty from mercury and to remove. It becomes very strongly radioactive. The, the proton beam enters here and the shell of uh, here from thin iron uh, will become uh, more and more uh, get some damages, some, some it will uh, lack strength after a while and um, also inside you have uh, when the proton beam comes boiling mercury with uh, bubbles that collapses mm -hmm. And you get these cavitation forces, like when you have a, a, a water pipe with, uh, with gas inside, and it starts to vibrate very heavily. So to dampen out this, they must inject uh, gaseous uh, helium into the <coughs> mercury. Anyway, to avoid, uh, to, to prevent this from, from um, <coughs> breaking, they have to change it after 45 days of uh, uh, use. <clears throat> and then they have to actively cool down because of the radioactive processes that do not stop immediately when you close uh, the electrical circuit. But it will continue and will create heat inside. So they have to cool it down for some days. <clears throat> Another risk is <coughs> uh, two hydrogen filled moderators with liquid hydrogen that comes into and to uh, making the neutrons going a little bit slower so they won't damage the pieces you are studying in this microscope. Here we can see the mercury circuit. Here is a piece that is change. Under <coughs> is a dump where you let out the mercury when, when you change this piece. <coughs> and the dump is about five tons of mercury. And the active uh, mercury that is in the circuit is about 15 tons. So that is why there is a small confusion about how much mercury is really used in each target. 15 tons is circulating and 5 tons is in the top. But uh, 1 ton of mercury, more or less, maybe it doesn't matter. <laughs> Here is the same picture you can see <coughs> I showed to you uh, earlier. And maybe it would be possible to read this text. I think it was also easy, but we, they are talking about remaining mercury droplets inside the target models to have to evaporate and so on. And uh, as far as I can see, this cannot be conceived, uh, considered as a closed target. It cannot be considered as a, a closed circuit when you are forced to open it up every one and a half month to change important pieces, take this out. They are so radioactive, so you cannot touch them. They have to be in an intermediate storage before you can transport it away. <clears throat> Here is a whole procedure how to change uh, this, the target piece. Uh, 
now since the active removal, removal of decay heat for the first 12 hours. So it's not enough to just cut off the electricity and everything is okay. An accident could happen if the electricity goes away permanently. permanently. All, all these uh, pictures I had here in the last part, they were taken from their own, their own papers and investigation <coughs> that is made centrally in Europe by the former ESS Council. And uh, if you want to see the links to this, you can look at uh, the homepage of uh, uh, the um, uh, Lunds Naturskyldsforening. <laughs> Ah. Thank you very much. I just have a short message from uh, the organizers of all the activities in uh, Melbourne. They say it's quite important that we go and get a participant passport like this. Each one should have them with a name and so on. Or one day. Is it here? Mm -hmm. uh, they said this morning that it was supposed to be here, but uh, asked downstairs in the reception the because there were some problems this morning. And, and we are not supposed to let anyone in if they haven't got these ones, but as there were so many problems, we couldn't ask you for the, for the passports. We have a visitor from Turkey. We don't have much time, but he would like to uh, say a few words. Maybe we should say your name too. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tanay Sırtguya. I am a professor in Marmara University. I'm a nuclear master's PhD with coal, but now I'm an associate professor of renewable energy in Turkey. So when I was graduated in 1980, uh, the cancellation of the tenders in USA has started, as you all know, uh, uh, due to its the cost, as you have mentioned. Uh, the citizens, they don't want around them such a facility which they need to be protected from. The third one is the waste. The fourth is the uh, monitoring by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is too expensive. So these are the main reasons after 1978, if no tenders and 100 of them also cancelled, which were ordered in 1973. Germany, you know, is uh, taking everything down. And UK uh, is trying to uh, calculate how they will decommission this 91 billion pounds is required for 19 reactors. This means for each commissioning one, we need eight billion dollars. So uh, I'm here uh, representing my trade union, education trade union, and uh, public trade unions confederation in Turkey also. So uh, after looking at the discussions, uh, I did want to share with you my views. This uh, Argus Convention on Environmental Matters, we have access to information, uh, public decision-making, participation of citizens and decision-making process, and access to justice. So we need to have our countries uh, be a signatory on this. This is one thing, but we cannot wait for this. So what we did in Turkey, uh, I'm coordinating this activity, uh, farmers, uh, trade unions, consumer associations, medical doctors, and environmental NGO platforms, about 100 NGO. Uh, we are just trying to inform citizens, every single citizen, about energy efficiency and renewable energy. It works. And it's not an illusion. And the problem is uh, fossil fuels and nuclear. And the solution is uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency. They try to tell us, yes, we'll do all of them renewable energy, this is not possible. You cannot ask your child to smoke or not to smoke at the same time. So this is uh, the one thing. The other thing I want to share with you, uh, when you look from my country's point of view, the picture is a little bit different. But over here, as I see in Lund, the destination is becoming Lund over here. In 
Europe. But as we all know, nuclear power plants are not really power plants. They don't produce electricity. The harvest factor is 0 0.35. This means one nuclear power plant machine starting from the food preparation up to the point of the commissioning consumes three times more energy than it is producing. So this is a good enough justification for us not to take nuclear power plant machine as an energy production thing. Oh, it produces plutonium, this is okay, but for France, for example, we cannot say that they are producing their electricity 75% from nuclear. They are trying to be uh, power for war. No, I'm just finishing. Uh, as a war equipment, 75%, yes. But the electricity comes out, so they cannot throw it away. They just sell it with cheap to whoever receives. So we are ready in Turkey with all this structure with you to cooperate. I will give my information. I'm very happy that I have selected this seminar and this one. Thank you very much to all of you. I would like to say Yes, yes, I will just give my information to anybody. Thank you very much. For